Hello, everybody. Greetings and welcome to the Federal Highway Administration Alkali Aggregate Reactivity Webinar Series. Today marks the first of three sessions in the series, with subsequent sessions scheduled for each of the next two Wednesdays. Thank you for your uh, registering and for your participation. We hope it's going to be beneficial to all involved. These webinars are being conducted through the FHWA ASR Development and Deployment Program. The objective of these webinars is to provide information on ASR prevention and mitigation techniques to engineers and practitioners. For more information, search FHWA and ASR and you'll find this web page. There you will see background and contact information, an ASR reference center, ASR newsletters, ASR technical working group information, and other resources. Attendees are welcome to request a certificate of attendance upon completion of the series. Simply email your request to elga at the transtechgroup.com. These presentations are being recorded and will be available on the website after completion. Questions will be accepted via the chat box during the webinar. At the end of each section of each webinar, a short Q&A session will take place and the presenters will answer as many submitted questions as possible. If time does not allow all questions to be answered during the time available, the presenters will attempt to answer them via email after the webinar concludes. Here's an outline of today's session. We'll start with uh, Dr. Michael D. A. Thomas from the University of New Brunswick, and he'll be covering fundamentals of AAR. Then we'll go to Dr. Benoit Fournier at Laval University, who will cover symptoms of AAR. And finally, Dr. Kevin J. Fulliard of the University of Texas at Austin, who will cover AAR test methods. So without further ado, we will begin with Dr. Michael Thomas. I'm going to hand over the presentation to him at this time. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you out on the West Coast. Okay, I'm just going to give a start off with a little brief background uh, on the overall uh, workshop objectives here. This uh, whole series of workshops has uh, been developed under the Federal Highways Administration Development and De Deployment Program. Uh, we're giving a series of live workshops to about six or seven states and uh, we're giving this uh, webinar workshop uh, as part of that series. Uh, the objectives are to review the fundamentals of ASR, summarize methods of preventing in new construction and mitigating in existing uh, construction, discuss and recommend test methods and specifications for ASR, and to pro provide a few case histories that illustrate some of the symptoms some of the, and some of the measures for uh, prevention and repair. Uh, just to uh, let you all know how this is broken down, uh, as per the introduction, we've got three sessions today, two, three, and four on fundamental symptoms and ASR prevention, oh, sorry, ASR test methods. Next week at the same time, we'll be talking about prevention of ASR and specifications. And on the last Wednesday, we'll be talking about diagnosis and prognosis of ASR and repair methods. So that last day is, is really focused on um, what to do when you've already got ASR and it's too late to prevent it. So moving on, uh, this first presentation is going to deal with the fundamentals of alkali aggregate reaction. We're going to cover both types of reaction, ASR and ACR. I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a background and history on them and uh, talk about some of the mechanisms as well. And then later on, we'll hear about prevention. Alkali aggregate reaction can be divided into two types of reaction, the alkali carbonate reaction. ACR and the alkali silica reaction, ASR. Uh, to give you a, a brief definition of both, and these definitions come from the uh, ACI website on terminology. There used to be a document on terminology in ACI, but this is now all electronic. Uh, ACR is a reaction between the alkalis, sodium and potassium, 
from Portland Saman and certain carbonate rocks, particularly calcitic dolomite, dolomitic limestones st uh, that are present in some aggregates. And the products of the reaction may cause abnormal expansion and cracking of a concrete in service. Alkali silica reaction, on the other hand, as the name implies, is a reaction this time between the alkalis from the cement and siliceous components of the rocks. Um, certain minerals such as opaline chert, strained quartz, and volcanic glass that are present in some aggregates can react with the alkalis and uh, produce expansion and cracking in the concrete. The workshop in general, um, all three days, will mainly focus on ASR. We will touch on ACR. Uh, the focus is on ASR mainly because that's by far and away the more pre uh, prevalent of the, the two reactions. ASR has occurred pretty much in uh, most geographic locations around the world. ACR is relatively infrequent and restricted to a few isolated locations. Um, but we are going to cover it in this, uh, in this workshop. One of the important things to distinguish between ASR and ACR is if we have alkali silica reactive rocks, there are things that we can do to enable us to be able to use them safely. ACR, on the other hand, alkali carbonate rea reaction, cannot really be preventive, and the only way to deal with this is to by, avo by avoiding the reactive phases by uh, selective quarrying. And another thing to bear in mind, which we'll get to later on today, is that some ASR methods may fail to identify uh, alkali carbonate reactive uh, rocks. Bit of background, AC ASR has been with us for just over 70 years now. Um, well, at least since it was first discovered in the late 1930s in, uh, in California by Thomas Stanton. He wrote his first paper on the subject in 1940, so we've been aware of a reaction for, as I say, for, for quite some time. Um, at that time that Thomas Stanton published his paper, there were a number of agencies and owners of structures who were observing problems uh, related to cracking and expansion of the concrete. This is one famous case, the Parker Dam in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, people weren't sure what was going on, but uh, Stanton's publication in 1940 sort of paved the way for people to start to understand this problem and recognize that they had the problem and uh, realize that they, uh, they actually had to do something about it. Almost 10 years after uh, uh, Stanton's discovery, ASR had kind of spread its way from the West Coast towards the eastwards and the problems that occurred, as I said already, in, in Arizona, in Idaho, Oregon, and they started up here in the Midwest as well, and uh, a, an early case in Virginia. So uh, by the sort of late 1940s, it was still a relatively rare phenomenon that hadn't affected by any means the whole of the United States. This is a map that was produced around about 2000. It's already significantly out of date, but it shows you how ASR had spread uh, by 2000, and uh, you can see by this map here that pretty much every uh, state in the United States, at least the contiguous states, have had some problems with ASR. Every star on this um, on this map here doesn't just represent a single case of ASR; it represents a, a geographic region where cases have occurred because of the geology of the aggregates. Many of the states that don't have stars in them. Uh, on this map, uh, we have since discovered, or ASR has been reported in those states, and I, I think now it would be fair to say, as I've said before, that pretty much all 48 of the contiguous states have our, some cases of alkali silica reaction. Uh, only Hawaii and uh, Alaska seem to have been spared uh, to date. Similar situation in Canada. Um, actually, before I go on, though, it, it's interesting to note there is there seems to be even though ASR started in the West, there seems to be more cases in the in the East, and I think this is partly a reflection of the fact there's perhaps a higher density of infrastructure in the East, but it's also due to the fact that historically the alkali contents of the Portland cements have been higher in the East than they have in the West, and I think believe that's still the case. Uh, this shows a map of Canada, same situation in Canada. Every single province of Canada has a problem with ASR. To date, we don't have any problems with ASR in the, uh, in the Northern Territories, uh, 
up here. Let's see if I can use this highlighting tool. Um, we don't have much concrete construction up there for one reason. The other reason is it, it's very cold up there, as you can imagine. And ASR is a chemical reaction that is accelerated by temperature. And uh, it can literally take many, many more decades for ASR to occur in cold temperatures than it does in warm temperatures. Uh, so temperature has a big impact too. Similar situation in Canada, we have a higher density of ASR on the East Coast. And again, this is because, as with the, the US, the cements in Canada have been higher in alkali on the East Coast than they have on the West. ASR affects pretty much every type of structure. Um, if there's moisture available, ASR can occur in, in any structure, any concrete structure, providing the required ingredients are there. Um, all civil engineering structures are shown here can be effective, uh, whether it's a hydraulic dam, uh, a concrete pavement, retaining walls, bridges, pretty much every type of concrete structure has the potential to be affected by alkali silica reaction. We're going to briefly review the mechanisms in a, in a fairly simplistic way, just so we have a, a sort of broad understanding of, of how ASR occurs. And to do this, we're going to start off by imagining concrete to be a, a simple two-component system. I think most of us know that's not the case. A simple two-component system, in this case consisting of a reactive aggregate, which is silicious in nature, and it is, in this case here is a silica particle, SiO2. And the silica particle is sitting in the, uh, in the cement paste. We know that the uh, cement paste of concrete is, is, is not a solid material. It is porous. It can absorb water. And when it's in a saturated condition, the water that's in those pores is actually very rich in, in, in um, ions, uh, very rich in, in, in species. Predominantly alkali ions, sodium and potassium, that's the, uh, the Na and the K you see here, uh, originating from Portland cement. And these are dominated by hydroxyl ions, OH minus ions. Um, after one day, there's almost nothing else in the pore solution. There might be a little bit of calcium, maybe a tiny bit of silica, but after the first 24, of, 24 hours of hydration, the pore solution is almost entirely sodium, potassium, and hydroxyl ions. The very high hydroxyl ion concentration gives rise to a very high pH in excess of 13. Many textbooks will tell you 12 and a half, but typically concrete will have a pH in excess of 13. Very caustic material. In actual fact, despite its name, it's actually the hydroxyl ions that first attack the silica. Um, and this is an important distinction because what this means is that only alkali, only sodium and potassium hydroxide solutions will attack the silica. Uh, solutions of sodium chloride or potassium sulfate, potassium chloride, won't attack the silica unless there's an opportunity for those sulfates or chlorides to be uh, converted to hydroxyl ions in the pore solution. So we really need that high pH, the high hydroxyl ion concentration uh, to, to attack the silica. Um, Basically, what happens is the, uh, the very high pH, the hydroxyl ions break down the bonds that hold the silica together. The silica sort of passes into solution. It dissolves, if you like, and then it, uh, then it combines with the sodium and potassium that's in the solution to start to form a gel-like material, what we call an alkali silica gel. Uh, this uh, X-ray image here from Kim Curtis of Georgia Tech actually shows a reactive silica particle passing into solution. You can see, uh, get a sense of the fact the solid material is dissolving into a high alkali solution. That's initially what happens uh, in, in the high pH in, in the concrete. To say that that silica that passes into solution uh, will combine with sodium and potassium and with minor amounts of calcium that's available too and form an alkali silica gel. That alkali silica gel has a, a, is extremely hygroscopic, has a huge propensity or huge affinity for water, and will absorb as much water as it can from a surrounding cement paste. And, and by absorbing that gel, uh, it basically expands. It starts to swell as it absorbs the water from the surrounding cement paste. And as the gel continues to expand, 
it will eventually lead to cracking of the surrounding cement paste. And, and that is essentially what we, our first signs of ASR uh, when, when we're dealing with it in concrete is, uh, is the swelling of the aggregate and the cracking of the surrounding cement paste. And uh, we end up with an image that looks something like that in our, in our concrete structure. This is what ASR can look like in a concrete thin section. Uh, this is a, a, a microscopic section cut from a piece of concrete. It's polished so thin that it will actually transmit light. It's under high magnification. The width of view here is about one millimeter or 40 thousandths of an inch. And uh, so the, 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 the grain you can see to the left is actually a small sand grain. It's actually a grain of flint or, or a flint aggregate. It's a reactive aggregate. And the brown stuff is the cement paste uh, on the right-hand side, top and bottom. The aggregate is expanded. It's cracked. And you can actually see a crack running through the aggregate and out into the surrounding cement paste. And in certain parts of this crack, what you'd see is a reaction product. Here's gel actually inside the, the crack in the aggregate. And here's gel actually filling the crack out in the cement paste. We call this a site of expansive reaction. It's evidence that ASR has occurred, and not only that ASR has occurred, but it's actually caused distress for, to the surrounding cement paste. And this is an important feature, an important symptom to find if you're going to diagnose ASR as the cause of some apparent uh, damage in the, in the structure. This is now showing a polished sample at lower magnification. Now we're looking in reflected light. We have a thick chunk of concrete, so it won't transmit light. But we have a similar situation that we can observe at lower magnification. This is a reactive aggregate particle here, volcanic glass or rhyolite. Uh, and you can see that internally it's cracked within the aggregate. And it's not as clear as the last slide, but that crack actually passes out into the surrounding cement paste here and down here too, and it passes into an adjacent aggregate particle. And there is gel. It's not too visible of this low magnification, but here's alkali silica gel uh, in association with this reacting aggregate particle. And no doubt at higher magnification, you'd be able to observe gel in some of the aggregate cracks too. Again, uh, this is a symptom of expansive reaction. It's a, uh, a reliably diagnostic feature. If you see something like this, you, you can see that you've got alkali silica reaction. And not only that, you can see that alkali silica reaction has caused distress in the surrounding cement paste. Um, so you can uh, positively diagnose, as, diagnose ASR at least a, as a partial cause of any distress that you have in your structure. OK, so having learned a little bit about the, the mechanisms of ASR, we can see what the three main ingredients are that we need. We need a source of reactive silica, uh, which will be provided by the aggregate. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped forwards a little bit there. Uh, we need a sufficient supply of alkali, which is provided by the pre predominantly by the cement. And we need a supply of moisture, um, generally more than the moisture that's originally mixed in with the concrete. We need some external source of moisture as well to get significant ASR to occur. So let's start off with the reactive silica. Let's think about you know, what, what rocks, what aggregates are reactive. Well, it just depends. Um, on, on, on the left, we have a, a list of rocks that uh, have caused, that, that are used in concrete and probably have caused ASR at one time or another. But you can't tell by just looking at the rock name whether that rock's going to be reactive or not. A rock is a fairly generic term for an assemblage of minerals. And uh, the reactivity of a rock will really depend on what its uh, mineral content is. The, 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 it will depend on the, the type and the amount of, of minerals that are present. So rocks are made up of, uh, of, of many, many minerals. Um, and there are literally thousands of different types of minerals out there, and I've named a few there. Only a handful of these are actually reactive, and the reactive minerals are listed there. We have opal, tridymite, cristobalite, volcanic glass, cryptocrystalline or microcrystalline quartz, and we have strain quartz. These are the reactive forms of uh, reactive minerals that, that, that can be found in our aggregates. Of course, there are, as I said, literally thousands of other rock-forming minerals out there that are not reactive. 
uh, and I've just listed a handful there, but as, as the slide says, it's literally thousands more. So if we were to consider something like a granite, is it reactive or not? Well, a granite will contain many phases. It might contain some feldspar, for instance. But what would determine if a granite is reactive or not is how much strain quartz or even cryptocrystalline quartz can actually be found in that granite. So some granites will contain very little of these reactive minerals and they won't be reactive. Some granites will contain none. Uh, uh, sorry, some granites will contain more and they will be uh, deleteriously reactive in, in concrete. Another good example is limestone. Limestone is called limestone when you have a rock which is predominantly calcite and calcite is a non-reactive mineral. Uh, so generally, limestones could be considered to be non-reactive. But limestones can contain, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent of other reactive minerals apart from other minerals apart from calcite. And there are some uh, limestones out there that contain small amounts of opaline silica uh, that are, or cryptocrystalline silica that's actually in sufficient quantity to make that limestone reactive. And this is our silica reaction. This is where we can sometimes get confused with terms. We would call the limestone a carbonate rock, but it's the silicious component or the silica component of a carbonate rock that is reactive, so it's actually alkali silica reaction. It's alkali silica reaction occurring in a carbonate rock. Just to give you an example of the, the, the different reactivities uh, of different types of, of mineral and aggregates, we have a graph here that shows a list of different rock types here. And uh, what we're seeing on the, the, the right is, uh, it, it, on the x-axis here, is the amount of dissolved silica, the amount of silica that dissolves um, when that aggregate is actually placed in a solution of very strong alkali at a, at a high temperature. 80 degrees Celsius is 176 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that some rocks like, uh, or some minerals like opal up here uh, are very soluble. They're highly reactive and a lot of the, the silica will pass into solution as shown here. Whereas a, a mineral like quartz, well crystalline quartz, shows almost no solubility at all and very little silica passes into solution. Let's concentrate on those two end members there because it's interesting to, to, to look at them further. If we look at the mineral opal and the mineral quartz, if we looked at the chemistry of those uh, minerals, we quartz is almost entirely silicon dioxide, SiO2, silica, uh, and uh, opal is, is, is predominantly silica as well. They're chemically very, very similar. Opal might contain a few impurities in there too. Despite their chemical composition, one type of silica is highly reactive, the other type of silica is, is, it's highly reactive and, and uh, soluble at high pH, and the other type is almost uh, uh, insoluble and won't cause reaction in concrete. So why is that? Well, we really have to look at the crystalline structure of those forms of silica. And that's what this graph shows here, or this, this figure shows here. It shows uh, quartz on the left and opal on the right. They're both con con composed of silicon and oxygen predominantly. Um, but whereas quartz is very well crystalline, has a very, very rigorous crystal structure, and uh, which makes it fairly stable thermodynamically, opal is a complete mess. It, it has a very disordered structure, uh, hardly any crystallinity. We could almost consider it amorphous. And it's this that actually makes it reactive. Uh, so it's an important thing to, to, to realize it's not the chemical composition of the aggregate but to, to determine its reactivity, which is just as well, otherwise all silica aggregates would be uh, reactive, but it's actually the structure of that silica that's important. The disordered amorphous silica, the glassy silicas uh, are more reactive than the more crystalline, well-ordered silicas. Okay, so that explains the role of silica. What's the role of pH? Well, for a silica, for, for silica a, 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 in regular tap water would not be very soluble at all. Uh, it's not until we get into a high pH environment the silica starts to break down. We need those hydroxyl ions that, that sort of first schematic showed. This shows, again, it's just showing the solubility of silica or the amount of silica dissolved. This time of just one form of silica, it's actually a very reactive amorphous silica, 
but it's showing it as a function of pH. And what we can see here, relatively, uh, uh, even up to relatively high pHs of pHs of 12 and maybe even 12 and a half, which is the pH of saturated calcium hydroxide solution, virtually no silica passes into solution at all. It's not until we actually get into the much higher pHs that we start to see uh, silica dissolve. And of course, these pHs are the pHs that we might encounter in concrete. Another thing that affects the solubility of silica that's not shown in these slides is temperature. Uh, as the temperature increases, the solubility of silica will increase too. And even some relatively insoluble forms of silica, like well crystalline quartz, will actually start to dissolve and, and therefore become reactive if you go to very high temperatures. Um, quartz itself becomes soluble and reacts at temperatures in excess of uh, of 120 or so uh, degrees Celsius, so you know something like 240 or higher uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So that doesn't normally affect us in, uh, in in concrete, of course, but it can affect us if we're looking at accelerated test methods, where we use very very high temperatures to try to accelerate uh, the reaction of aggregates. Okay, I'll go back to our reactive requirements again, uh, reactive silica, or alkali, and moisture. Uh, what actually are the sources of alkali in concrete? Well, the main source is Portland cement. Portland cement, even though the alkali content of Portland cement is generally less than 1%, it's still a major player because those alkalis are soluble. Other cementing materials that we use in concrete, particularly fly ash, can themselves contain Relatively high, uh, rel relatively high amounts of alkali. Despite this, they tend to be effective in controlling ASR. Uh, they actually, even though they contain alkalis themselves, they actually tend to combine with some of the alkali from the Portland cement and actually prevent expansion rather than contribute to it. However, we'll save that discussion until uh, until next week when we talk about preventive measures. Some chemical admixtures can contain alkalis. Usually we're using chemical admixtures in such small doses that, that it's not really a, a significant amount. Wash water if used, uh, wash water from returned concrete, uh, can also contain alkalis originating from a cement that was originally in that uh, wash water. And if we're trying to do an inventory of the alkalis in concrete, we really should consider including the, the alkalis that might be in the wash water. Aggregates themselves can contain alkalis, and this can be quite a significant contribution uh, with, some, with some types of aggregate. However, we don't really have a standard test method for measuring the alkalis contributed by aggregates, so we tend to, uh, we, we, we tend to disregard it mostly, and that's uh, perhaps something we, we need to look at more carefully in the future. And then, of course, we have external sources of alkalis that we might expose our concrete to. Seawater contains sodium. Uh, we put sodium chlorides uh, on, onto our concrete as de-icing salts. And occasionally, we even put potassium-containing materials like potassium acetate onto our concrete. So we, we, we have to consider at least the exposure environment that the concrete's going into and whether or not we need to include those alkalis in the external environment when we're trying to assess the, uh, the risk of reaction. But in summary uh, of this slide here, I want to stress that it's mainly the Portland cement alkalis that are uh, the, the, the main contributors to, uh, to the expansion. If we look at a typical oxide analysis, which you can see here on the left, we can see that you know we know cement, Portland cement's a, a, a calcareous material, it's predominantly calcium oxide. Most cement plants are sited near a source of limestone. That's the main ingredient. And then we have the second highest ingredient is silica, and then we have lesser amounts of alumina and iron. And generally, those four compounds will make up somewhere in the region of 90% or more of the, the composition of the Portland cement. The alkalis, the potassium oxide here and the sodium oxide here, actually represent a very small proportion of a cement. But they're important because once, the, once we mix the cement with water, it's the alkalis that are the main soluble phase, and these alkalis actually pass directly into solution. And as we 
discussed before, the pore solution after 24 hours is composed almost entirely of potassium, sodium, and hydroxyl ions. So despite the fact that they're only present in very small amounts, they dominate the pore solution, and there's enough of them to raise the pore solution pH to, to an excess of 13. So they are important. Um, you know, we're dealing with two types of alkali in Portland cement. We have our potassium, we have our sodium, and uh, we like to try and use a single number to describe the alkali content. It's easier to deal with num one number than two. So what we do is we convert the potassium oxide to an equivalent content of sodium oxide. And we do that by uh, using the respective molecular weights of the two compounds. We combine those and we, we, we call the, the the combination the total sodium oxide equivalent, often written as Na2OE, the E being for equivalent. Sometimes you'll write Na2OEQ instead, or the EQ being for uh, equivalent. And the sodium oxide equivalent is calculated by, um, you have to excuse me, my computer is running a bit slow, is calculated by, by taking the sodium oxide content of the cement and adding to it 0.658 times the potassium oxide content. And that 0.658 is not just a fudge factor, that is actually based on the molecular uh, ratio of, of um, sodium oxide to potassium oxide. What that actually means is a pound of potassium oxide will contribute to ASR roughly the same as 0.658 pounds of, of sodium oxide. So we use that equation to come up with our sodium oxide equivalent. If we were to look at this analysis here and try to calculate it, we take 0.15 sodium, we take our 0.73 potassium, multiply it by this 0.658, add them together, and we get a 0.63% sodium oxide equivalent on the border of being what we know as a low alkali cement. It is possible to squeeze the pore solution uh, out of cement paste. We can put them in presses under very, very high pressure and actually squeeze the juice out. Typically, we need pressures in excess of 65,000 PSI to do that or 450 megapascals. And once we've got that solution out, we can actually analyze it for various species. If we were to do that, and what we've done here is taken this as a, a graph showing the pore solution chemistry, and they've uh, actually analyzed the hydroxyl ion concentration, squeezed out a cement paste produced with cements, Portland cements, with a range of alkalis, ranging from the lowest tier, which is about 0.3, to the highest, which is about 1.3. And that represents most of the cements that are available in North America. And you can see that the uh, aggressiveness of the pore solution, in other words, the concentration of hydroxyl ions, is directly related, linearly re related, to the actual amount, amount of cement in the alkalis. So, and it's, I guess it's kind of uh, intuitive, high alkali cement is going to create a high alkali pore solution and create a higher risk of ASR than low alkali cement. If we looked at the, the cements that we have across North America, you can see that they do actually represent a fairly broad range of alkali contents. This graph shows 60 analysis for 69 cements, and it shows about half of them are below 0.6% and about half of them above 0.6%. The 0.6%, uh, will, you'll see, is relevant in a minute because 0.6% is the value we used as a demarcation between uh, for, for low alkali cement. The definition of low alkali cement came from Thomas Stanton's early work. Remember, he was the guy who discovered ASR. He did a, he, he actually also developed a test method for uh, measuring the potential for ASR. He came up with this mortar bar test method, which was the precursor to ASTM C227, where you made little one inch by one inch mortar bars, 10 inches long, and you stored them over water in a sealed container. Uh, ideal conditions for ASR, especially because he discovered that if you put these at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you would accelerate the reaction too. Temperature accelerates the reaction. He did this for, he made these little mortar bars for seven of his aggregates, for, sorry, for the main reactive aggregate they had in California, and he made seven mortar bars or seven cements. 
and he found that the expansion was related to the alkali content of the cement, and most importantly, he found that he didn't see any deleterious expansion when the cement alkalis were below 0.6%. The data from these seven data points basically fixed our definition of low alkali cement for the next 70 years, and, and, and it still does in many people's minds. Um, it's generally considered uh, anything below 0.6% alkalis is a cement that has a low risk of ASR, and, and, and that might be true, but we have to remember, uh, and I'll show in a minute, this doesn't mean there's no risk of ASR when you have a low alkali cement, it just means that the risk is, is, is lower. Um, we all see across it that throughout this workshop examples where ASR has occurred with low alkali cement, cements less than 0.6% alkali, so it, it, it's not sufficient on its own just to control the alkalinity of the cement. What we've learned uh, in the past few decades is we have to control the alkali content of the concrete. What this rather confusing graph shows here, it shows this time the, the expansion of concrete rather than mortar bars, stored in a very similar way to Stanton's mortar bars, stored over water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, larger size prisms because they're concrete prisms, and we're looking at the expansion at one year. And we're now looking at that expansion expresses a function of the alkali content of the concrete. Um, and of course the alkali content of the concrete depends on the alkali content of the cement and the cement content. So we can have a low alkali cement, but if we have a lot of low alkali cement, we can still have a high alkali content in our concrete and get ASR. So we really have to consider the alkali content of the concrete, not just the alkali content of the cement. We calculate the alkali content of the concrete uh, quite simply. Uh, the alkali content of the concrete in pounds per cubic yard of equivalent soda is the cement content multiplied by the cement, the alkali content of the cement in percentage equivalent soda, and of course we have to divide by 100 because the alkalis are in percent. Of course we have a similar equation for calculating that if you want to calculate it in SI units in kilograms per meter cubed. So a worked example there would be if you had a concrete with 650 pounds per cubic yard of cement, the cement has a 0.7% alkali content, uh, then we're going to have an alkali content in the concrete of about just slightly over five pounds per cubic yard of alkali. <clears throat> As the last slide, a few slides ago, I showed the relationship between the expansion and the alkali content. Um, for those of you used to working with pounds per, per cubic yard, please look at the axis on the top. We have kilograms per meter cubed on the bottom. Most aggregates will show this kind of a relationship between the expansion and alkali content in the concrete. And a lot of laboratory research will show you that if you're below about five pounds per cubic yard, or three kilograms per meter cubed, most aggregates won't expand in laboratory conditions. And for a long time, that five pound per cubic yard, or three kilograms per meter cubed, became a sort of accepted limit for concrete alkali contents. Because it worked in the lab for most aggregates, uh, it was actually adopted in the field. Unfortunately, one of the things we've learned over the past few years <coughs> is that we can actually get expansion in the field at a lower alkali content than we can in the lab. And uh, uh, the reasons for this are that in, in the laboratory with the relatively small samples that we get or that we use, some of the alkalis are leached out during testing which means the alkali content in the specimen lowers, reduces during test. In a much larger element exposed in the field, the leaching is much less significant, which means we don't lose alkalis, and that means that alkalis, the reaction expansion can occur at a lower alkali content. Okay, back to our little triangle here of the three requirements for ASR. Um, we've considered this reactive silica, we've considered the alkali, uh, let's consider the moisture. Uh, this is a nice slide showing the role of moisture, because uh, it's a nice pictorial representation. What we have here, you can see cracking in a sidewalk, this is a sidewalk at the Albuquerque airport. 
Uh, this part of a sidewalk here is exposed to the rain, but as we go under this 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 part of a sidewalk here, we're passing underneath a bridgeway, and there's no direct rainfall. And if I expand that section here, I think you can see that where the concrete's exposed to rainfall, it's cracked, and where the concrete isn't, it's it's uncracked. Now that's not to say that this concrete won't crack eventually here because there's still moisture in the atmosphere obviously but the wetter concrete, the concrete that has the more moisture will, will ASR will occur much more fast, the expansion occurs more quickly and will get cracking at an earlier date. Putting a bit more science on that relationship this graph here shows expansion of concrete prisms at two years so all the data here, all the expansions are for two year old prisms and these prisms were stored in five gallon pails with salt solutions to provide different levels of humidity. Uh, this is where we, this 100% is where we hope to be in our the prism test we use in the laboratory. Uh, and you can see that, that, that if I have 100% humidity, I store the concrete over water, try to maintain as damp a conditions as possible, I get a high amount of expansion. But as the humidity reduces, my expansion decreases. And it's generally considered that once the relative humidity inside the concrete drops below 80%, ASR will stop, the expansion will stop. And although we don't really take advantage of that when we're building new construction, we certainly won't try to eliminate moisture from new construction because, you know, that's just impractical if you're building a dam or a bridge or something like that. When we're dealing with existing construction, so existing structures that already have ASR, uh, the reactive silica the react and the, the alkalis are already in the concrete. There's not much we can do about it. And very often our only option then is to actually deny the concrete water, to try and exclude water from the concrete. Um, so we try to reduce the internal relative humidity. It's very challenging to do this and to get the relative humidity below 80% might be impossible in many cases. But I think you can see here that even if I don't get it below 80%, if I can bring it down from 100%, I'm going to significantly reduce the rate of expansion. And when we're trying to deal with expansion in the field, that might be the best that we can hope for, is to slow things down. Maybe we can't stop them, but we can slow them down by time, extend the life of the structure. So more of that in two weeks from now when we talk about um, uh, methods for mitigating ASR in existing structures. Uh, you, you'll see then that controlling the relative humidity it, it is one of the um, principal tools in our toolbox, if you like. As I said, trying to exclude water from a civil engineering structure is not something you, 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 you want to have to do, uh, uh, is not something you want to do un unless you really have to. Um, civil engineering structures by by nature of a type of the structures are usually exposed to, to uh, an abundant supply of moisture unless we're building in, a, in an arid environment. Okay, moving on uh, fairly quickly to alkali carbonate reaction. Um, I'm going to go through alkali carbonate reaction relatively quickly because it's, it's I would say of less importance because it, it's not as widespread, but I think it's of growing importance, if you excuse the pun, uh, there have been more cases of ACR, there's been more research on ACR recently, and there's quite a lot of controversy surrounding ACR as well. Uh, so I, I think it's something we, we need to focus a little bit more attention on. It was discovered almost 20 years after the discovery of alkali silica reaction. It was discovered in Canada. Uh, I think the Canadians were jealous that the U.S. had their own reaction. I think some people thought it was alkali Canadian reaction to begin with, but it's 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 not. It's carbonate reaction. It was uh, discovered first of all in uh, in eastern uh, eastern Ontario, in an area around a place called Kingston. Um, and what set it apart initially, it, almost immediately, um, was the fact that it seemed to occur very quickly compared to to ASR. And when this occurred in Canada in the late 50s, uh, the Canadians already had some experience with alkali silica reaction, and they were surprised at just how rapidly uh, expansion of cracking occurred with alkali carbonate reaction. The other surprising thing about ACR that was discovered in this first initial paper was that the test methods that were in vogue at the time 
which were the 289 quick chemical test method and the 227 mortar bar test method, neither of those tests were capable of detecting or identifying alkali carbon reactive rock. So it was clear that we were, uh, I said, that these researchers were dealing with something different. Currently, um, alkali carbonate reaction has been uh, limited to uh, just, go back to that slide here, just a few states in the United States, and these are cases that have been reported and confirmed at least to, to, to some extent. So it's occurred in a few states in the United States. It seems that you're unlucky if a state begins with an I. And, uh, and also, of course, in Ontario and Canada, where it was first, uh, first discovered. There's a classic rock type uh, that's subjected to alkali carbonate reaction, and that is a, an argillaceous dolomitic limestone. Uh, dolomite is a mixed calcium magnesium carbonate, as you can see here, that sits somewhere between calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. Uh, so that explains what dolomite is. What do I mean by argillaceous? Argillaceous essentially means it's, it's a dirty dolomite. It contains lots of fine-grained clay materials and silica materials and, and fine-grained calcite as well. So it has a lot of sort of clay, muddy materials associated with it. And this gives it a, a fairly unique petrographic texture. Um, this shows a, 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 an image of a, an alkali carbonate reactive rock. And the, the sort of the classic texture that we see is little dolomite rhombs. These are these little rhombic shaped particles here. Uh, generally, the particle size range, you can see more of them here and here, particle size range of 10 to 50 microns. And they seem to float in a sort of fine-grained, muddy matrix that you can see here and here that compo is composed mainly of clay minerals, calcite, and, uh, and some silica. Uh, and this is quite a unique texture. And this is what a, a trained petrographer who has experience in alkali carbonate reaction would look for uh, when he's doing a petrographic examination. This just shows a, a, a similar slide showing the same feature, just, just a quite a, a different type of view. Uh, and again, you see the dolomite ROMs here and the fine grain matrix here. You know, the dolomite ROM up here, uh, obviously. What happens with uh, alkali carbonate reaction is we have a process occurring that's called de dolomitization. And that is exactly what it describes. The dolomite is de-dolomitized. We lose the dolomite. The dolomite breaks down. This calcium magnesium carbonate breaks down into a magnesium hydroxide and calcite, calcium carbonate. And it's broken down by the action of, of alkali hydroxide, or sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. We often write these equations for sodium. But the same reactions occur with potassium. Uh, what's strange about this process is that the, the actual, if we look at this reaction as we move from this side of the reaction to this side, there's actually a reduction in volume of the solid components, which has meant it's fairly, it's, it's meant, it means that it's been fairly hard to explain de-dolomitization as the cause of expansion because we're actually reducing in, in solid volume. And as a result of that, people have tried to explain the expansion mechanism based on other theories. Initially, one of the most uh, favorable, uh, one of the most um, favorite ones was the swelling of clay minerals. The idea being that dedolomitization of a rock provides access to water for the clay minerals, and they swell. And that's, I, I think, generally that's been disputed, and, and I, I'm not sure that, that many people follow that school anymore. A more recent explanation is the third bullet here, is that a number of workers have since suggested that, you know, maybe it's not the dol de dolomitization that's causing expansion, but it's actually microcrystalline quartz in that fine gray matrix that is reacting. And of course, that would be alkali silica reaction. And so there is a, and I'd say it's almost a growing school of thought that says alkali silica, that alkali carbonate reaction might just be a form of alkali silica reaction. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the middle mechanism here is, is one that explains what actually happens uh, it, it, when a dolomite particle de-dolomitizes is the magnesium in that dolomite 
sort of migrates to the edge of the particle, and the brucite, brucite grows around the original dolomite grain. And the original dolomite grain of the structure of it is retained by the calcium carbonate that remains there. So you essentially get a growth of brucite around the particle, uh, which actually leads to an, an expansion. You're increasing the size of the particle, even though there might not be a total increase in, in solid volume. Uh, you know, this is a very interesting d debate, and I, I, I think it, it, it's one that requires further research and further understanding. Uh, regardless of the mechanism, the, 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 the point that I want to make is that even if alkali carbonate reaction is a form of alkali silica reaction, the rocks that undergo this dedolomatization tend to cause ex tend, tend to cause expansion and produce behavior that's very different from regular alkali silica reaction. Um, and I'll explain why that is uh, in a moment. I've already discussed this reaction here. Um, the, the, the second reaction that occurs is this alkali carbonate reaction that was a product of the initial reaction. I'm sorry, this alkali carbonate product uh, is highly soluble. It's still in solution and it will react with calcium hydroxide to actually regenerate alkali hydroxide. So between these two equations, what you'll say is, see is that the alkali hydroxide that was used here is replenished here. Uh, so the alkalis are completely recycled and regenerated. And this might be one explanation for why low alkali cement is generally not effective in, in controlling alkali carbonate reaction because the alkalis are not consumed, they're recycled. Actually, for this is a little bit of an aside for those of you interested in petrography. Because of this second reaction here, what we're doing is converting calcium hydroxide to calcium carbonate. And, and some of you probably know that that's basically the process we call carbonation in concrete, where we lose alkalinity, we lose pH. And when rocks are undergoing the dedolomatization reaction, you'll very often see a loss of pH around the reacting particles. Now you'll see that if you spray the surface with phenolphthalein solution. Now phenolphthalein turns purple where you still have a high alkali and remains colorless where the concrete's carbonated. Just as I said, an interesting aside, and here's some, some more examples of carbonate halos around reacting dolomite uh, rocks. So I mentioned before that the, the, the certain char characteristics that distinguish alkali carbonate reactive rocks from typical alkali silica reactive rocks, regardless of the mechanism. So even if you believe that ACR is really a form of ASR, the rocks that undergo ACR, this dedolomatization, differ for, for, for these following reasons here. The damage occurs relatively rapidly. Uh, one to two years, even in cli cold climates. I know down in Texas they might see ASR in one to one to two years, but in Canada it generally takes eight to ten years. But alkali carbonate reaction can occur in one to two years, so it occurs on a different time scale. Expansion occurs with very low alkali cement, or perhaps it would be more correct for me to say in concrete with very low alkali contents, two pounds per cubic yard, and perhaps even less. Potsalans like fly ash, silica fume, natural potsalans, and slag are generally not effective, even when used at unusually high replacement levels. So 65% slag, for instance, isn't effective in controlling ACR, even when it's used with a low alkali cement. Lithium-based admixes are not effective. Uh, we see reduced expansion, or even no expansion, when the coarse aggregate is crushed to sand. Now we know with ASR, if we take a sand and we crush it to cement size, we also kill the expansion. But with ACR, if we take a coarse aggregate and crush it to, to, to sand size, so say we crush it to the size needed for a, a mortar bar test, it won't expand. And then we have some test methods that actually fail to identify the reactivity of these rocks. So I think these things, you know, regardless of the mechanism of expansion, these things set ACR reactive rocks aside, and these rocks that are, you know exhibit that petrographic texture and undergo dedolomatization and cause expansion have to be treated separately from typical ASR reactive rocks, regardless of, of what the mechanism is. And uh, that that.
concludes. I'm sorry, I don't have a summary slide there. I don't know what happened there, but that concludes the the, the presentation on on fundamentals. I'll happily take any questions now or or later if that's the that's the plan. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Thomas, uh, we do have uh, a handful of questions that we'll go ahead and uh, and mention at this time. Are you able to see the questions in your queue there? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> First one is, uh, was the graph correct regarding only one known ASR issue documented in Pennsylvania? ACR issue in Pennsylvania. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, no. You are talking about ASR. Is it, is it possible? Have I still got control here? Yes. Okay. Let me just uh, go back to that, that, that. Well, I don't need to do that. That, that map's an old map, f f for one thing. Um, and every star on there is, you know, I think maybe we've come to a time when we shouldn't really be showing that map anymore. Every star on there kind of represents a, more than one. It could be multiple occurrences of ASR. And I, I'm sure, and that star is probably, uh, you know, placed in the region where they have the, uh, the, the gray wacky that's, that's caused problems in Pennsylvania. But I'm sure there are other locations in Pennsylvania that, that, that have problems with alkali silica reaction that just, just haven't been documented in, in a form that's been, been uh, collected for that map. So I would say there's, there's probably way too few stars in general on that map. We kind of just use it as an illustration for how, you know, the occurrences of ASR blossomed between 1950 and, and the year 2000, and, and since 2000, and there's there's probably a, you know, a hundred more stars we could add to that map at least. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Do we know how much water is needed to cause the reaction? It's not really a case of the, the, the amount of water, it's a case of the, the, if you like, the availability of the water. Um, so I, if you've got concrete that has sufficient degree of saturation, such as the internal humidity in the concrete is, uh, you know, 90% or, or higher than the sufficient moisture. So it's, it's, it, it's more of a vapor pressure issue than the quantity of water. Um, so the relationship between the quantity of water and the relative humidity will depend on the porosity and pore structure of the, of the concrete itself. But I would say generally if a concrete is more than 95% saturated, uh, you're, you're probably going to have sufficient moisture in there to drive a reaction. But it's, it's, it's probably better to quantify that in terms of humidity. So, you know, 90% and higher, you, you, you're going to have enough to drive ASR. Below 90%, the rate of ASR falls off significantly and, and even stops at 80%. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the alkali percentage of fly ash, and can you please comment on ASR in concrete containing fly ash? Well, the alkali content of fly ash can vary very widely. It can be lower than 1% for some fly ashes, and some ashes can contain up to 10% percent alkali. They're, they're unusual, but there are sources of North America that can contain close to 10 percent. Um, now, the, the thing with fly ash is not all of that alkali is available. The amount that is available is dependent on how much fly ash you use and, and the, the other compositional parameters of that fly ash. Uh, it, it becomes a, it's a little bit of a tricky issue to say how much of it's available, um, because once you put fly ash into concrete, it's taking along that alkali with it, but it also reacts with the alkalis that are already there and actually helps to consume some of those alkalis. So it's, 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 a, it's very tricky to trying to get the alkali contribution from fly ash. Generally, low alkali fly ashes that are low in calcium as well are, are very, very efficient at controlling ASR. But as the calcium content of the fly ash increases, all the alkali content of the fly ash increases, they become less effective. Um, we will discuss that in, in quite a bit of detail uh, next week when we deal with preventive measures, because in preventive measures we will discuss, uh, you know, the use of fly ash slag, silica fume, and all of these things to control ASR. Uh, I can make sure that I add, you know, maybe an extra slide to really deal with that in a little bit of detail if it's, if it's something that's of interest. Okay.
Okay. Uh, I think we have time to, to take one more of these before we need to move on. Um, just a reminder that those of you who have submitted questions, if we don't get to them, uh, we will try to follow up via email um, after the, the webinar to uh, get you those answers. Uh, this one is, are, the seal are there sealers on the market that could sufficiently keep ambient moisture out of a precast product to lessen the likelihood of ASR? The answer to that would be yes, because the, the question says to lessen the likelihood. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work in this under the Federal Highways Program and showed that under certain, certain conditions, certain products, if applied correctly, will result in a reduction in maternal, internal relative humidity of the concrete and can decrease the, the, the speed of ASR. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't rely on, rely on them as a, as a means for dealing with ASR and new construction. You know, it's much better to make sure it doesn't happen in the first place. But I think that we, our research has definitely shown that some of these sealers can have a positive impact, uh, not a total cure by any means. And I hate to keep deflecting questions to later sessions, but if you wait for two weeks, uh, the last presentation of all about the whole workshop here would, would deal uh, quite comprehensively, I think, with uh, the use of sealers and coatings to control ASR. Okay, I uh, appreciate those answers. And um, now we're going to move on to part two. Uh, we'll hand it over to Benoit Fournier, who will cover the symptoms of AAR. And uh, attendees, feel free to keep um, sending in those questions and we'll have a short Q&A after this presentation as well. Thanks. OK. Thank you. So now you should uh, see my, uh, my screen, hopefully. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to uh, present this uh, second um, um, session of this, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, in the first uh, presentation, Mike uh, actually uh, showed very well the different uh, mechanisms involved in, uh, in both uh, ASR and ACR. What are the different factors that would uh, uh, make these uh, reaction to uh, develop and be maintained in, the, in concrete? Uh, so the topic of this uh, second presentation is really to give you an overview of what are the typical symptoms of, uh, of AAR in different types of uh, concrete structures. So I'm going to move to the next one. Oh, I don't think I can change. Sorry, I don't think I can change the slide here. My apologies, I'm just uh, trying to move on and change the slide, but it doesn't seem to work. Uh, okay, now I do. Okay, so um, what is important to, uh, to remember from um, all the slides that I'm going to show uh, in this presentation is that some of the features that will be described are actually indicative of AR. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are necessarily a definite proof that AR is the main factor responsible for the deterioration that uh, that is affecting the structure. In this uh, in this uh, picture that we sh uh, that you see on the screen, you have a uh, a bridge structure that is um, quite badly uh, affected by ASR, but also uh, uh, the the effect of freezing and thawing. Has, has played a big role also in the uh, in the distress that uh, the, that you you can see on the structure. So ASR has been a main factor in that case, uh, but uh, obviously when the freezing and thawing action uh, will play on the on the concrete, the uh, the damage and the distress will be accelerated uh, extensively by uh, both mechanisms acting at the same time. So the common visual symptoms of uh, of ASR and ACR in structures will consist generally of cracking, expansion causing deformation, relative movements and displacements, misalignment between members of uh, structures, uh, localized crushing of concrete due to 
excessive expansion in, uh, in, in the concrete member. Uh, extrusion of a joint or sealant material uh, in, uh, in the joints, uh, for instance, in the, uh, between con concrete pavement sections. Uh, the presence of surface pop-outs and also sur surface discoloration, L-gel and gel exudations. So we're going to go through those various uh, symptoms in the, uh, in the slides to come. In the case, uh, for example, of uh, uh, reinforced uh, concrete pavements like that, um, it's, um, the, uh, the expansion due to ASR will be uh, restrained by the, the presence of the uh, reinforcement. And uh, quite typically, what, uh, what will happen is that uh, uh, surface macro cracks will, uh, will appear the, uh, on the concrete uh, pavement section, as you can see there. And uh, if you take cores out of those um, uh, pavement sections, typically uh, what you will see is that uh, uh, surface macro cracks uh, will penetrate in the concrete a few inches uh, down in the, uh, in the concrete pavement. Uh, it could be from the top uh, of the pavement here, as you can see, and from the, oops, sorry, and from the bottom part as well. Uh, and, uh, and uh, what is uh, very interesting to see is that with time, uh, those macro cracks here that you can see will uh, probably develop also into a, a fairly extensive micro cracking pattern in the uh, in the inner part of the uh, of the concrete uh, member. So there is a distinct uh, difference between the surface macro crack and the internal part of the uh, of the concrete element that will be more, uh, I would say, um, um, characteristically affected by a, macro, a micro cracking pattern compared to the macro cracks that you see at the surface. Uh, a similar um, uh, pattern would, uh, could also uh, be observed in massive concrete structures such as hydraulic dam like that. In this case here, it's uh, the Coniston uh, Dam near Sudbury, Ontario in Canada. Um, so there is a, an extensive network of uh, macro crack at the surface, but uh, uh, coring has, uh, has shown that the, uh, the cracks will penetrate uh, at depth at about uh, uh, half a meter uh, or a couple of uh, uh, feet at the, at the most. And then inside the, the, the more massive part of the, uh, the concrete uh, element, the concrete structure, there would be micro cracks due to ASR as well but the upper uh, part, the surface part, is, is affected more by the, the macro cracking pattern. How do we explain this type of, uh, of uh, behavior? Uh, this can be shown uh, on, this, on, on the following cartoons. Uh, if you have, for instance, here a, uh, a concrete block foundation uh, em embedded in the ground, uh, due to alkali silica reaction expansion, there will be an expansion here in the inner part of the um, of the concrete element, uh, but there is a distinct difference between the inner part there, where the relative humidity in the in this part of the concrete is much more homogeneous in the whole section of the concrete compared to the surface here, where the uh, the, the surface layer there is uh, is more uh, uh, dry. It's also affected by alkali leaching due to the effect of uh, rain and, and, and water running. There will be also carbonation with time. And the result of this um, difference between the more homogeneous inner part here where there is three-dimensional expansion process due to AAR and uh, the surface layer where the uh, AAR is, it is happening as well but at, at a lower rate is that there will be a, a differential expansion going on between the inner part and the, and the surface part of the concrete structure that will result in a, um, sorry, that will result in a uh, differential uh, expansion and cracking. So the surface will be in relative tension compared to the inner part of the, of the element there. Uh, and this will cause indeed the, the, the formation of the macro cracks at the surface uh, of the element. The, uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, reinforcing steel will be uh, very important also in, the, in that process. Uh, reinforcing steel will 
contribute at confining uh, expansion due to ASR and the uh, and, and the portion of the concrete. The restraining effect of the expand of the uh, reinforcing steel will depend on the uh, detailing characteristics of the uh, of the structure. Uh, when the structure is very well reinforced, then uh, reinforcement can control uh, expansion due to ASR to a larger extent. But what will often happen is that with time, uh, also if also if the uh, the reinforcing steel system is not uh, strong enough or detailed enough, there will be some uh, expansion going on in the upper portion of the uh, of the concrete that will result in the formation of surface cracking as well. So the um, um, the development of the cracks at the surface over there will be. Uh, a function of the extent of the uh, of the reinforcing uh, detailing, and uh, and also of the conditions to which the uh, the concrete element is subjected to. Obviously, when you have a cracking appearing at the surface of a reinforced concrete element, this will be a uh, this will be a concern, uh, especially in in uh, areas where uh, the icing chemicals are spread on the uh, on the structure. To, uh, to take care of the ice and the snow. So that will result in the potential penetration of uh, sodium chloride uh, into the concrete, which in turn could cause the uh, corrosion of the reinforcing steel and uh, contribute to additional damage generation due to uh, corrosion and freezing and thawing uh, in, inside the affected element. Um, when when Expansion due to ASR will uh, happen or will occur in concrete element that is unrestrained or poorly restrained uh, by reinforcing steel. Um, typically, this um, um, element, this concrete element, will be showing what we call a, a map cracking pattern or pattern cracking, which is very very typical of the uh, of uh, of this type of of a internal expansion. Uh, Map cracking is not necessarily a result of, uh, of internal expansion due to AAR. It can result also from other mechanisms uh, such as uh, shrinkage and other mechanisms. So the, the, the fact that you will see pattern cracking or map cracking at the surface of a concrete element is not a definite indication of, of AAR, but uh, AAR in, in uh, happening in concrete elements that are poorly reinforced will often show this type of uh, pattern of cracking. In the case of uh, pavements, uh, this, uh, this case here is an advanced case of ASR in a concrete pavement. Uh, what will typically happen is that the expansion of the, of the concrete being restrained in this direction here, the expansion will be uh, enhanced in the lateral direction in the uh, concrete uh, pavement, which will result in the formation of a, a, a longitudinal pattern of cracking uh, that will develop in the concrete element. Uh, with time, with the ASR or AAR expansion developing uh, further in the in the pavement, the main longitudinal cracks like that will be will start to be connected by smaller cracks which will give a pattern cracking as we have explained in previous slides. In the case of uh, pre-stressed concrete members, as uh, uh, illustrated in this slide, uh, the, um, the expansion is restrained in that direction, uh, resulting in increased expansion in this direction. And uh, the result of that is the development of longitudinal cracks as you can see in, the, in this picture. Uh, the same thing will, uh, will happen also in the case of, uh, of uh, concrete columns, uh, as illustrated in this slide. Um, since the expansion is restricted to occur in this uh, direction, typically the expansion will occur at a faster rate in uh, this uh, direction, and the result will be the development of a main cracking pattern in the vertical direction like that. And as illustrated in the, in the previous slides for the, the pavement, 
what will happen is that also with, with time, the main cracking pattern will be connected by the uh, map cracking pattern. Uh, when you get closer to the, uh, the, con the affected concrete element, you will be able to, uh, to see both type of, uh, of patterns of cracking. This is an example of a bridge structure that, uh, that was demolished about two years ago, uh, close to my university in Quebec City in Canada. Uh, this structure was very, very badly affected by ASR uh, and also other problems uh, such as freestyle corrosion. Um, we can nicely see the different patterns of cracking in the different elements of the, uh, of the structure. Uh, some longitudinal crack here in the bridge deck. Uh, also longitudinal cracks here in the uh, concrete columns, pattern cracking in the, in the foundation block. Uh, here you have a, uh, a more detailed picture where you see actually the longitudinal cracks that have developed in the, in the Y-shaped columns and uh, there are some reinforcing steel actually connecting the, uh, the, the column and the deck there so that's why you actually see some cracks that will actually curve in that direction, so the, uh, the cracks will follow the direction of the reinforcement in that case. Since uh, ASR will not necessarily develop at the same rate or the same extent between the different uh, members of a concrete structure, one thing that uh, you could see also in uh, AAR affected uh, concrete structures is misalignment of adjacent sections in a concrete member. So as, as I said, the main reason for that could be that there is differential expansion between one part of the structure and the other. This can be due to a different concrete mix design, different alkali content, uh, different exposure conditions to sun, uh, to rain, etc., etc. So this differential, uh, this difference in the conditions uh, inside or outside the concrete element can actually result in, uh, in different expansion rates, uh, which will result uh, then in uh, uh, relative movements and misalignment of uh, different sections in the concrete uh, structure. This can be seen in this, uh, this example here. This is an hydraulic dam. Um, there is a, a lot of ASR expansion happening in the more massive uh, uh, mass section of the, of the concrete uh, dam and the expansion is restricted uh, in different directions, but it's easier for the concrete to create expansion in the directions toward the, um, the spillway here, as you can see. And, uh, and this push that you get from expansion due to ASR, you can see the effect here in the upper portion of that, uh, that concrete pier. Um, and uh, if we look at a, a magnification of that area, the, uh, the effect of the expansion of the underlying uh, mass section pushing towards the in, in, in inside of the, towards the spillway has caused the, the failure of this, uh, of this pier and also uh, jamming of the gates in the, in the spillway. Um, the effect of, uh, of expansion uh, due to ASR can be seen also in this, uh, uh, in this slide, which is uh, from the, um, the Albuquerque airport in New Mexico. Uh, so there is an expansion of concrete going on in the uh, concrete pavement, uh, which is overlaid with asphalt. The expansion of the concrete is pushing, actually, the adjacent building foundation, which is causing the um, the shearing of the concrete column, as you can see here. And uh, this can be seen in, the, uh, in this slide, and also you can see the effect of the expansion of the, uh, the, the pavement uh, here, which is causing the tilting of, the, uh, of those columns, as you can see. Um, when you have excessive expansion in, in concrete members, such as this uh, bridge girder, um, the expansion can actually cause the, uh, the, the loss of the clearance between the girder and the embankment or the abutment wall, uh, causing uh, eventually, when the expansion is excessive, the, uh, the crushing of the girder end. Uh, obviously, in that case here, there might be also leakage of uh, at the joint between the, the, the different elements of the bridge causing uh, water to run here 
and, and also causing the uh, corrosion of the steel reinforcement. But uh, this has been reported in a number of, uh, of structures where the um, expansion of concrete members has caused the, the, the loss of clearance. This can be seen in this slide also where you have an expansive uh, section of a concrete uh, pavement against a, a section that is not uh, expanding at the same rate or at the same rate or is not uh, expanding at all and the relative movement uh, caused by the expansion of the this uh, pavement uh, section here is causing the extrusion of the joint material as you can see here uh, another dramatic picture of this uh, this exact same type of uh, of process where you have uh, ASR uh, happening in a pavement uh, that picture was taken after about four or five years uh, a pavement uh, incorporating a highly reactive siliceous limestone uh, where the excessive expansion due to ASR has caused spalling at joint like that and also extrusion of the uh, sealant material between uh, the different uh, pavement sections. This can happen not only in pavement section but it can happen also in barrier walls as you can see here uh, relative expansion and excessive expansion can cause uh, shearing of the uh, of the different uh, uh, sections of this uh, barrier wall and crushing and spalling at the joint of uh, between the different sections of the of the barrier walls. Uh, in the case of pavements, um, cracking will often uh, concentrate. Um, between the joints, as you can see here, at the intersection between the joints and concrete pavements. Uh, we have to be careful uh, by not confusing this type of cracking that is uh, related to ASR to uh, cracking due to decracking, which is caused by uh, frost susceptible carbonate uh, aggregate material. Uh, but quite often, the expansion due to ASR will occur close to the, um, the joints like that uh, uh, because there is a more availability of moisture close to the joints in general and uh, this will increase the rate of, of reaction and expansion and the cracking, the resulting cracking uh, close to the joints like that. With ASR uh, expansion um, continuing in the, in the pavement sections, um, there will be spalling at the joint as you can see here. Uh, those spalls will need to be repaired over uh, over time for obvious uh, security and safety reasons. And as you can see, in some cases, the uh, expansion is uh, and cracking is such that uh, extensive repairs need to be done in uh, in, uh, in pavements affected by ASR. Um, this is an example uh, also of. Uh, problems related to expansion due to ASR in large hydraulic dam. Uh, main problems are related as illustrated in a previous slide to the action of the uh, of expansion in the gravity section and the expansion is greater towards the, um, the, the middle part here where we have the spillway structure and which will cause a misalignment of those uh, piers and some cracking as well. Uh, and operational issues due to uh, the uh, difficulties in operating the gates in the, uh, in the spillway. Um, a dramatic example uh, uh, of, of this type of operational issues uh, uh, is, is um, this dam here. It's the, called the Mactaquac Generating Station in New Brunswick in eastern Canada. Uh, we'll come back to that example uh, several times during the, um, the, the webinars because this is a, an interesting in bracket case of, uh, of ASR where engineers have been have, have have been showing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of they have been doing a lot of work trying to deal with the expansion uh, due to ASR, and um, they, they have shown a lot of uh, interesting engineering uh, judgment in terms of finding the right solution to deal with this uh, expansion process. So we you can see on this slide here the intake structure and the powerhouse where there are issues due to uh, ASR. Uh, if we take a section through this uh, this dam, you can see the intake structure here. Uh, the upstream part is here. The water flow is like that. We have the penstock uh, 
which is the water passage here, the, the, the penstock, and you add the powerhouse here. So there is expansion due to ASR and the different elements of the, of the structure, um, which is causing serious operational issues. Uh, some pictures of the intake structure, as you can see a lot of cracking due to ASR and different portions of the, uh, of the intake structure. You see the, the penstock here and the um, generating station the, um, uh, at, the, at the bottom part there. So um, basically what's, uh, what is happening in, such a, in that case is that the water is flowing like that. You have a, um, the, uh, um, the generating station, the powerhouse that is illustrated here. Uh, you see the turbines. So the expansion due to ASR is happening in the, in the concrete casing of the, the turbines and the powerhouse and uh, there is a restraint uh, due uh, to the, in the longitudinal as, uh, axis of, the, uh, of the, the structure which is causing expansion to happen in the vertical direction and the ovaling of the, of the turbine openings. Uh, this is creating a huge operational issue um, in the dam and the engineers have decided over the years to uh, go through a um, uh, frequent slot cutting uh, process in order to relieve the pressure and uh, be, uh, due to the expansion of the concrete affected by ASR. So uh, we'll come back to that in, in later uh, in other presentations. Um, uh, other, I would say, typical features of uh, ASR affected concrete elements is what we call the discoloration or the brownish coloration that you can see at the surface of the uh, affected element. Uh, we call that also gel staining. Uh, this is due to the leaching uh, of the gel and some calcium hydroxide from the uh, inside of the concrete uh, affected by ASR and with the uh, carbonation uh, uh, due to the exposure to atmosphere there would be a, uh, what we call a gel staining, which gives the appearance of a permanent dampness at the surface of the affected element. And you can see the same thing uh, in, in, the, uh, in those bridges as well. Another example which has been, um, another feature which has been often associated to ASR but is not necessarily typical of ASR is the presence of pop-outs at the surface of a uh, ASR affected uh, concrete element. Uh, what will happen is the, uh, for instance, in this case here, you have a reactive reactive chert particle. Um, that uh, particle is suffering from ASR expansion, uh, and it creates expensive pressure on the surrounding cement paste, and uh, this causes a conical failure of the concrete above the particle, as you can see here. Um, so this will happen when you have a reactive uh, uh, siliceous particle, but it can also happen when you have a uh, frost susceptible aggregate as well. Um, so the presence of pop-outs like that can be due both to uh, ASR and uh, freestyle action on, uh, on some uh, uh, concrete elements. So we have seen a number of features of ASR in, uh, in concrete, uh, different types of concrete structures. Um, let's now have a look at the features of alkali carbonate reaction. Um, as you can see here, quite typical cracking pattern that will be uh, similar to ASR, relative movements also between uh, the different members of the, uh, the concrete structures like you can see here. One thing that, uh, that uh, is, is often uh, observed is that this, uh, well, that slide is not very much in focus, but if we go back to this one, you can see that the, uh, the cracks here will not necessarily uh, demonstrate the typical um, uh, staining that we could see when we had ASR affected uh, elements. So in this case, the, uh, the, the cracking appears drier, if you like, uh, compared to ASR affected uh, structure. So this is one of the factors that may indicate that this alkali carbonate reaction might be a bit different compared to the uh, alkali silica reaction because of the relative absence, if you like, of the staining 
along the the, uh, the cracks at the surface of the uh, of the concrete elements. Um, this example is a, is a quite uh, dramatic example of expansion due to alkali carbonate reaction. Uh, this is uh, in uh, in Cornwall, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, you have a uh, curb here section, and you have the concrete sidewalk. Originally, both the, the curb and the sidewalk were against each other, and with the expansion of the sidewalk affected by alkali carbonate reaction, um, since there was restraint of expansion in the long longitudinal direction, the expansion of the sidewalk was, uh, was uh, increased in that direction, and it caused actually the separation between the curb and the sidewalk. And this uh, separation, as you can see here, is a few inches. You see the cracking pattern here due to alkali carbonate reaction. And this, uh, this uh, gap here has to be filled with uh, asphaltic material for obvious uh, safety uh, reason. So this is giving you uh, an example of, uh, of how extensive can be this uh, reaction due to ACR. And this happened over only a few years after construction. So, as a concluding remarks, uh, this presentation summarized the common uh, visual symptoms in ASR and ACR affected concrete structures and, mem and members. Uh, such uh, symptoms can be detected through uh, routine visual expansion, uh, inspection of concrete structures. Um, but the exact role of ASR and ACR in the deterioration process should generally be confirmed through the petrographic examination, of course. So I showed you a number of examples. As I said in, uh, in my first slide, those are not necessarily symptoms that are uh, uh, fully indicative or, uh, uh, of, of, of AAR. They are indicative in a sense, yes, uh, but uh, uh, generally speaking, taking cores in those uh, concrete uh, structures or elements is, is the next step that is necessary to confirm uh, that ASR or ACR have been involved in the process of deterioration. And this will be discussed in more uh, depth in the, uh, in the session number seven on diagnosis and prognosis of, a, uh, of AAR. Thank you. So this is uh, basically the, um, the end of this uh, session on symptoms of AAR. I can uh, entertain questions, if any. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fournier. Um, we will uh, go over a few of the questions that have been submitted before we move on. Um, I'm going to open up uh, the open up the audio to the other presenters in case they want to chime in on some of these as well. Um, the first question we have is, how much expansion can occur in severe situations? These examples appear well beyond the magnitude of laboratory tests. Yes, the expansion actually can be uh, fairly high. In the case of, uh, of the Mactaquec uh, Dam in New Brunswick, I think the, uh, the growth of the, of the dam has been about uh, 18 inches. Uh, Mike, you're, uh, you can confirm uh, that number. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's grown in height by 7 inches. 7 inches, okay. But, it, but it's had 18 inches cut out of its length in terms oh, of slots, okay. and, and those slots have all closed up, so yeah, effectively it's grown eight inches in length. In length, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the expansion can be uh, quite extensive as you, uh, as you can hear, yeah. Okay, uh, next question is, are there documented studies of the use of fibers to mitigate ASR-induced tension? Um, that's a good question. Uh, fibers will contribute at, uh, at reducing uh, expansion, but will probably not, in general, uh, uh, totally control the expansion due to ASR and, 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 the, um, uh, and the cracking as well. Uh, it, it, would, it would help, but not necessarily control uh, the, uh, the overall process. Yeah. There's some actual work published by Claudia Osterag uh, that deals with that issue. I, I, c I can find a publication and send it to the person who posed the question if you like. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, next question is, uh, please shed more light on the visual difference between decracking and ASR at a panel corner. Okay. Uh, let's try to go back to this. Uh
Um, the, the pattern of cracking that you will see due to ASR uh, could be relatively similar to what uh, decracking will cause uh, as well. Um, the, uh, the presence of staining uh, at the crack uh, surface like that will be an indication that, um, that ASR might be at least a factor in the process. Um, but as you can see here, this could look very much like a pattern of cracking due to uh, decracking. So in both cases, the problem is due to expensive aggregate uh, particles. Uh, so the confirmation uh, of, uh, of the exact process of, uh, that has caused the, the cracking and the expansion, uh, this, this has to be confirmed through uh, coring and petrographic examination of the concrete core. Okay, thank you, and uh, we're going to move on now um, in the interest of time. To those attendees who have uh, submitted questions that we did not get to, we will try to follow up uh, via email after the uh, webinar is complete. Um, and if we have some extra time at the end today, we'll, we'll go back to some of those as well. Now we will uh, move on to AAR test methods presented by Dr. Kevin Foliard. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and get started here. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is my audio coming across okay? I guess it is. Okay, great. Yeah, you're good. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, to present this webinar today, and uh, the focus of this session will be on uh, ASR test methods, and. What we'll do is we'll go through the various uh, test methods that exist today. Um, we'll go over quite a few of them actually that are that are standardized tests, but we'll really focus on uh, a couple of test methods in particular uh, that are most commonly used, and these are also methods that we recommend as part of our uh, AASHTO recommended practice, uh, which is called the PP65-11. Uh, one point should be made up front with this is that uh, at this point in time, we really don't have the perfect test method. Uh, we, we really don't have a test that can evaluate an actual job mixture. Um, so there's a lot of ongoing work, and towards the end, I'll speak a little bit about uh, the movement towards this ideal ASR test method. So this slide here uh, lists the, the various uh, ASTM and AASHTO test methods that are um, used for alkali silica reaction. And uh, what you'll notice here is that the, the first two methods that are listed are tests where we uh, test the aggregate itself. Uh, we're not making mortar, nor are we making concrete in these two tests. Um, I will go through each of these test methods in a little bit of detail um, in, in just a little bit. Um, the, 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 the next test methods that are shown here, there are four listed that are mortar tests. and um, there's a variety of different methods out there, but I will focus primarily on the last two, which is AASHTO T303, the accelerated mortar bar test, and also the, uh, the parallel test for that, which is ASTM C1567, which is intended to test uh, the use of supplementary cementing materials uh, to, to control a reactive aggregate. Lastly, we'll focus on uh, ASTM C1293, which is the concrete prism test. So let's start going through the list here, and we will start first with, with the petrographic examination. Uh, the test method that's followed is ASTM C295, and ASTM C295 is a technique by which uh, a qualified petrographer will evaluate a given aggregate source um, through the use of either thin sections or polished surfaces. And it's a very powerful technique that has quite a bit of utility uh, in terms of uh, evaluating aggregates uh, as well as evaluating concrete uh, that has undergone uh, damaging alkali silica reaction. Now, when a petrographer uh, performs this evaluation, uh, there's a, a few main goals. And, and first and foremost, the main goal is to try to identify potentially reactive minerals. Uh, as shown here on the slide, there are different uh, reactive minerals that we know um, uh, contribute to alkali silica reaction. These were discussed uh, earlier by, by Mike Thomas as well. 
Um, and different agencies or uh, owners have different specification limits uh, above which you would uh, consider to have enough of this material or mineral uh, available to cause uh, expansion and cracking. Um, it, one point should be made is that there are some minerals that are not visible optically with the petrographic evaluation. Um, and as such, one needs to be a little careful in uh, concluding that an aggregate is non-reactive based solely on a petrographic evaluation. But it, uh, the, an evaluation will pick up the vast majority of reactive minerals. Um, one can also use this to track the source of materials uh, in a quarry to see if there's any changes between ledges or locations in your pit. And also it's uh, very helpful in uh, correlating a given aggregate source to uh, field structures in terms of field performance. Um, just a couple notes at the bottom there. Uh, the, the evaluation must be performed by a trained photographer and also as I said, uh, it's, it, one must take caution in, in uh, especially in accepting an aggregate based solely on a petrographic evaluation because there are some cases where you just will not uh, observe or quantify uh, reactive minerals. But uh, overall this is a technique that, that uh, we recommend as part of an overall suite of, of testing. And um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next test method. And the next test method is, a, is ASTM C289, uh, which is also known as the quick chemical method. And the, the, the goal of this test is to take an aggregate sample, it's ground down to a fine particle size uh, on the 100 sieve, and that material then is then immersed in a one normal sodium hydroxide solution um, at 80 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. And as was discussed earlier in the first session, um, the issue with alkali silica reaction is related to the fact that certain forms of silica are soluble and will actually dissolve. And that's exactly what this test measures. It measures the amount of um, silica that's dissolved into the test solution as well as the change in alkalinity. Now, uh, unfortunately, this test is not a very good or reliable test with regard to predicting field performance, uh, and it's generally not um, recommended in terms of using it as a standard test for acceptance. Uh, it's a very severe test uh, because of the, the high temperature and the high alkalinity, and um, it, it can lead to a lot of um, aggregates that perform well in the field actually showing up to be reactive in this test. So again, it's something that is not really recommended, but it, it is still sometimes used in some states and by some uh, highway departments. Um, but uh, it still does have its utility. You know, one can use this test because it's, it's pretty simple to run and pretty quick. And you could use this to evaluate your aggregates in a given quarry to see if the behavior is changing significantly from time to time. But again, we don't recommend it as a standard test for evaluating aggregates for alkali silica reaction. Um, the next method that I'll discuss is the first of the mortar bar tests, and this is the ASTM C227 uh, mortar bar test. This method was originally developed by Thomas Stanton uh, back in the late 1930s, and uh, this test involves storing small mortar specimens that are one inch by one inch in cross section, and they're stored above water at, uh, at 38 Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the expansion is then measured over a period of time. Uh, the biggest problem with this test, and, and, it, and it's a, a test again that we do not recommend, but uh, we are discussing all of these briefly today just to give you some background. The biggest problem with this test is that the, because of the very small specimen size, leaching is very significant. Um, and there are quite a few aggregates that will, um, the leaching will be so significant that you will not pick up any expansion at all on this test, even though the concrete in the field containing the same aggregate will actually um, show expansion. So that's the fundamental issue with, with, with it. Um, it's still included in the ASTM C33 appendix, but it is not recommended uh, uh, by our, our group uh, and as part of this webinar series. Uh, another test uh, that is sometimes used is a very similar test to, to the 227 test, and that is ASTM C441. This test is identical in terms of its test conditions, so we have small one-inch cross-section uh, mortar bars stored above water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 Celsius. 
the fundamental difference here is that uh, an actual or natural aggregate is not used, but rather Pyrex glass is used as, the, as a model reactive aggregate. And the intention of this test is to evaluate uh, supplementary cementing materials and determine how much, uh, how effective they are at controlling expansion relative to, relative to a high alkali um, control. Um, this test has the same exact downsides as the previous tests because the conditions are the same. That is, you'll get very significant leaching from uh, the, the mortar bar during the course of the test itself. But uh, the test is, is, is further complicated by the fact that Pyrex itself contains a, a quite high amount of, of alkali, which can vary from source to source, and its release during the test uh, can also uh, give erroneous results. Um, so also, there is no correlation to concrete aggregates because uh, all we're testing here is a model uh, Pyrex glass uh, type material. So. So far, I've more or less discussed a, a variety of different tests that have different downsides to them. What we'll start to do now is, is zero in on the test methods that are most commonly used and those that we recommend. Uh, the first one I'll discuss is the concrete prism test. The concrete prism test was originally developed in Canada. Um, it involves casting actual concrete instead of mortar. So uh, one can test a coarse aggregate uh, by, by testing it in, in combination with a non-reactive fine aggregate, or one can do the inverse and test a potentially reactive fine aggregate along with a non-reactive force aggregate. Um, the concrete mix is a, is a high alkali mix. Um, first of all, the cement content is uh, 708 pounds per cubic yard, which is quite high. And the uh, alkali content of the cement um, starts off uh, at plus or minus 0.9% alkali, but additional alkalis are added to the mix to achieve a total alkali content of 1.25%. Um, so, so this test derives all of its reactivity from this high alkali content, and um, the, the concrete prisms themselves are uh, three times the cross-section of the mortar bars, and so they're three inch by three inch by 10 inch in length, and because of the larger size, and also the fact that we're testing an actual concrete mix, the effects of leaching are not as significant as, the, um, as they are in the mortar bar tests, such as 227. But the leaching effect is still there. And uh, we'll see in a little while that it, um, it results in some limitations to the test, uh, such as the inability to be able to test a, uh, an ag uh, a given aggregate to determine its alkali threshold or the amount of alkali needed to drive the reaction. Um, this test is, is generally regarded to be the, the most accurate test in terms of um, predicting aggregate reactivity, but its biggest downside is the duration of the test. Uh, the test takes one year for testing aggregates, and if you're testing any preventive measures, the test must be run for two years, uh, and, and that is a, a pretty large impediment to its, its widespread use, especially here in the United States. Uh, with regard to testing, um, a, a, an expansion limit uh, it, that, that is most commonly used is 0.04%. 0.04% is about the level of expansion um, in the field that one would observe when cracking is first uh, noticed. So there's an actual uh, benchmark in terms of field behavior with regard to that expansion limit. Um, in uh, ASTM C1293 and in our ASHTO protocol, which uh, we will have a separate session uh, later where we will discuss the, the, the ASHTO performance specification. Um, but in the ASHTO specification, 0.04% um, is considered the expansion limit. Uh, other agencies, such as the Canadian Standards Association, uh, will, rank, will rank the aggregates um, based on where they fall in terms of expansion. Less than 0.04 is considered non-reactive. Between 0.04 and 0.12 is considered moderately reactive, and highly reactive would be anything uh, greater than 0.12% expansion. Again, when we get to the, the ASHTO performance limits, you, you'll see that we also have uh, various expansion limits uh, in terms of classifying the aggregate for its reactivity, but I will hold off on that discussion today since that will be covered in detail uh, at a subsequent um, session. So in terms of the pros and cons of the concrete prism test, uh, as I mentioned, it's generally perceived to be the best predictor of aggregate reactivity. 
It's generally suitable for evaluating SCMs and lithium admixtures without any significant modifications to the test. Um, but again, the issue there is that it takes two years to run the test, and that's uh, oftentimes a, a limitation. Uh, lastly, another good advantage of this test is that one can test real concrete with actual aggregate sizes. Uh, as opposed to the mortar tests where we have to crush a coarse aggregate down to a fine aggregate size in, in order to test. Um, one other limitation that I'll highlight in the next few slides is that one cannot use this test to determine the alkali threshold for a given mix. In other words, you won't be able to run this test and find out that uh, any alkali loading for a straight cement mix greater than, say, five pounds would cause um, expansion in the field. And the reason for that is that during the course of the test, a pretty substantial amount of the alkalis, maybe a third, will leach out during the course of the test. And therefore, one cannot use it as an index for evaluating alkali uh, contents. Let's go through an example here to, to highlight that point. This is a highly reactive um, sand from El Paso that was put into a concrete exposure block and stored outdoors in Austin, Texas. This is the standard ASTM C1293 mix, uh, so it has 708 pounds of cement and it has um, one and a quarter percent alkali, which gives it a total alkali loading of 8.8 .8 pounds per cubic yard. Uh, this kind of block with this aggregate at this alkali loading typically expands and cracks within one month um, in Texas, so extremely reactive aggregate, very fast reacting aggregate. And it's, it's very visible here in, in the cracking that you see on the block. The next slide shows uh, the same, basically the same mix design. The difference is, is that the alkali content of the cement now is only 0.95%, which means we didn't add additional alkalis to the mix um, like we did with the previous block. This results in an alkali loading of 6.7 pounds per cubic yard. And again, you'll see here that cracking is very obvious and quite significant. Uh, it, it took quite a bit longer for this block to uh, expand and contract, uh, to, to expand and, and, and crack, I'm sorry. Um, at about a year or so is when we actually observed uh, cracking and, and substantial expansion. But again, it's very obvious cracking. The third block I'm going to show next here is the same mix design, but now we've intentionally used a low alkali cement, which is 0.52%. Uh, Na2E equivalent, and um, with the same mix design, this gives us a alkali loading of 3.7 pounds per cubic yard, which is actually quite low, um, but yet you'll still see that with this highly reactive aggregate that uh, we still observe expansion and cracking. It took about a year and a half or so for the cracking to occur, but um, it certainly does still occur, and it, and it is obvious. Um, all of these blocks were measured as a function of time for expansion, and you can see that on this next graph. And with this next graph here, you can see that the highest alkali mix started to expand first, followed by the 0.95% alkali mix, and lastly, the low alkali mix began to expand uh, after about a year or so. But ultimately, over the course of, say, uh, three years or so, they all expanded considerably, well above 0.6%. Um, so uh, this is the way that, that our group and our research group uh, tends to evaluate concrete mixes for alkali thresholds is by casting these large blocks where leaching will be very minimal uh, because of the large size of the blocks themselves. Now what we did with this particular study here, and I'm going to show the results next, is we also cast concrete prism uh, specimens from each of these three mixes and then we then tested them following the standard ASTM C1293 exposure condition. And when one looks at the results, you'll see here that the high alkali cement expanded considerably. Uh, the next highest alkali content also expanded, and both of them were well above the expansion criteria set forth in ASTM C1293, which is 0.04%. But what's most important in the point of showing this graph is that the lowest alkali uh, mix at 0.52% showed essentially no expansion for the entire one year duration. And this is entirely due to the fact that, that leaching occurred um, in, in all of these prisms actually. But for this particular mix, the leaching was such that it dropped the alkali content of the mix below the limit at which it would actually expand in the field. So this just highlights the point that, um, that one cannot use this test for uh, 
establishing an alkali threshold. The next slide shows similar um, data from a different um, study performed by Mike Thomas. And this is basically showing mortar bars in green, the concrete prisms in red, and concrete blocks here in, in, uh, in, in blue. And what you see here is that the larger the specimen, the, the higher the expansion level we get because of the reduced uh, leaching with the larger specimen sizes. And you'll see that, that the larger the specimen, the, uh, the lower the alkali content required to drive the reaction. So size does matter in this case, and, um, and it, 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 it is a limitation, um, particularly when we're looking at the concrete prism test relative to uh, field data and concrete blocks. So with regard to the ASTM C1293 test, uh, the biggest complaint is it takes too long. Uh, one year for aggregates, two years for anything else. And uh, there have been efforts within ASTM, Canadian Standards Association, as well as European research groups to try to accelerate the test by increasing the temperature from 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And the intention here, uh, and there were some earlier reports suggesting that perhaps the test can be uh, run in three months now instead of one year for testing aggregates, and maybe only six months would, need, would be needed instead of two years for testing SCMs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the data that has been generated over the last 10 years is not very promising with regard to this accelerated test. And the reasons, um, the primary reason is that we get considerably less expansion at higher temperatures than we do when we test at the standard 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature. Somewhere, you know, in the, in the range of a 30 to 50 percent reduction in expansion when we increase the temperature. Now that probably seems counterintuitive because ASR is a chemical reaction, and chemical reactions are accelerated or in, uh, increased um, through temperature. But uh, what ends up happening with when you run this test at higher temperatures is shown here in the next slide. First of all, we've done testing within our, our groups to show that we, in fact, get more leaching at higher temperatures. So that's, that's uh, magnifying an issue that I already discussed. Also, when, when, when evaluating a coarse aggregate, in using a non-reactive fine aggregate uh, like we routinely do for the concrete prism test, we've noticed that that non-reactive sand plays a very, very large role. I don't really have time to discuss it much today, but there have been a few publications uh, that, we, that have been um, uh, in literature uh, that, that speak more to this issue. The last point that I'll talk about here, and I'll highlight it in the next couple of slides very quickly, is that not only are we uh, causing more leaching, uh, we also dry the concrete. Um, the, the prisms themselves actually tend to dry out more during the course of the test. But in addition, the, the, the pore solution in the concrete is also affected by higher temperature exposure. And what ends up happening, and I'll show you with, uh, very quickly with some, some data in the next few, few slides, but when we increase the temperature to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, we actually start to dissolve ettringite, which is a, a, a crystal inside concrete. And the sulfate that, that gets released goes into the pore solution. And the net effect is, is that the pH actually drops inside the pore solution. Uh, our index for pH is the hydroxyl content. And what you'll see there is that the sulfates are replacing the hydroxyl ions. And therefore, the aggregate's not reacting as much because it's not in as high of a pH environment as it was when we tested at 100 Fahrenheit. So let's look at, the, at some testing that was done a few years back where some, I'm um, sorry, the mortar um, specimens were cast, stored inside a, a, a tight container with just a little bit of excess water. Expansion was measured with time, and at various uh, ages, the uh, mortar bars were, were, um, were processed to remove the pore solution from them under high pressure, and then that pore, pore, uh, pore solution was then analyzed using chemical techniques. What you'll see here in the first slide is, is, my, is the most important point, on the y-axis here is the hydroxyl concentration, which is a direct indicator of the pH. And what you'll see here is as we go from low temperature testing all the way to, say, 60 or 80 degrees Celsius testing, our pH drops off uh, considerably, uh, given that the hydroxyl content here is, is decreasing. The, the effect is, is, is obvious, obvious at 60 degrees and even more so at 80 degrees Celsius. Um, if we look at uh, the alkalis in the, in the, in the, in the bars, um, they are reduced but at nowhere near as much 
as, as the hydroxyl concentration. And we always have to have balance between the positively charged uh, sodium and potassium and the negatively charged ions, which are typically just hydroxyl. Um, but what you'll see here in the next slide is what's coming into solution, as shown at 60 and 80 degrees Celsius, is that sulfates are actually going into our solution. And that, that was the reason why we saw the drop in the pH uh, two slides ago. So uh, just a word of caution, when trying to accelerate the concrete prism test, um, it's very, very likely that the expansions will be considerably lower for the reasons that I just discussed. And um, as of now, neither ASTM nor Canadian standards are, are considering the accelerated version of this test. So let's switch gears now and talk to about the accelerated mortar bar test. The accelerated mortar bar test was originally developed in South Africa. This is a test that tests uh, small mortar bars, one inch by one inch cross section. Uh, but you'll notice a fundamental difference between this test and all the other tests, and that is the bars are actually stored in a sodium hydroxide solution here. It's a one normal sodium hydroxide solution, uh, and the temperature uh, for testing is 80 degrees Celsius. So this is a very aggressive high temperature uh, and is essentially an infinite uh, supply of alkalis are provided to the specimen during the course of the test. And the idea is for the external alkali solution to penetrate into this bar and to cause the aggregate to expand and the expansion would then be uh, monitored. Uh, the test is, is most commonly run for 14 days. Uh, that's what is recommended in the AASHTO uh, protocol that will, that's uh, discussed at a later date, um, and also a little bit in this presentation as well. Uh, some agencies and owners and specifiers have uh, suggested that the, the test should be um, conducted for, for 28 days instead of 14 days, and we'll discuss that uh, in just a little bit more, a uh, little bit more detail. Um, one last point I wanted to make is that this test method, which is uh, AASHTO T303, um, has a parallel test that was passed through ASTM a few years ago. That's shown at the bottom of the slide, ASTM C1567. It's essentially the identical test conditions. The only difference is that the test allows one to uh, evaluate the use of supplementary cementing materials to determine how much uh, is needed of that given SCM to control expansion. Um, in terms of expansion limits, uh, the most common expansion limit that's used is a 14-day criteria uh, with an expansion limit of 0.1%. Um, ASTM 1260, C1260, also has some other classifications where if you're between 0.1 and 0.2% expansion, you'd be considered potentially reactive, and anything above 0.20, you would be considered to be reactive. Um, We'll, again, we'll, we'll revisit this later in this presentation when we talk about the AASHTO protocol, but most commonly in what we've recommended in, in our uh, Federal Highway uh, Guidelines and, and AASHTO recommended practice is a 14-day test dura duration and generally a 0.1% expansion limit. Now, when we start comparing the concrete prism test to the accelerated mortar bar test, uh, we, t we tend to see that we, we, we actually see quite a bit of, of uh, discrepancy between the two tests. Um, this data set here shows that we only get agreement between the two tests in about half the cases. So um, generally speaking, as I've said, we tend to rely on the concrete prism test as the best indicator of, of, of reactivity. So what this test is, is suggesting here, or this slide is suggesting here, is that the accelerated mortar bar test will give us the wrong answer about half the time when the test is run for um, 14 days. Um, what you'll see particularly are a lot of aggregates shown in this quadrant here um, where they fail the mortar bar test, but they actually do uh, quite well in the concrete prism test. And this is due to the fact that the, aggregate, that the test is very aggressive and the high temperature will make some aggregates uh, expand, whereas they wouldn't expand under normal uh, lower temperature conditions. Now, as I've said, there has been a suggestion to uh, increase this test duration to 28 days. And as one would uh, expect, as we increase the test duration to 28 days, even more aggregates will fail that have actually passed the concrete prism test and that are actually known to be non-reactive. So now we're only getting an agreement about a third of the time. So um, we'll see when we talk about the AASHTO recommended practice is that we recommend that uh, a, a user of the mortar bar test 
would first establish a correlation between the concrete prism test and the accelerated mortar bar test. And provided that that correlation is reasonable, then that would allow the use of the mortar bar test to evaluate aggregates and also uh, preventive measures. Um, we've done some, some work over the years to try to classify these aggregates. Uh, this is a bit of a joke here, but uh, the aggregates that we consider to be good actors are those, this is a follow-up to the last slide, where there's an agreement between the 14-day mortar bar results and the one-year concrete prism data. The data shown in this bottom left quadrant and the upper right-hand quadrant are considered to be good actors. These are aggregates that give the same answer in both tests, and uh, this would be our most desirable uh, situation to have. Unfortunately, as I showed in the previous slides, we will often find aggregates um, where we find quite a bit of data in this bottom right-hand quadrant. And this bottom right-hand quadrant, um, I, I first must mention the, the axes are reversed from the previous slide, so I, I don't want to confuse anyone with that. The data shown here will be considered to be the bad actors. These are the ones that are failing the, the mortar bar test considerably, but they are passing the concrete prism test. Again, the reason that uh, these bad actors exist, or the reason th that the results are, are such, is because the high temperature is causing the aggregate to expand, even though it's essentially non-reactive. These would be considered the bad actors, uh, the Alec Baldwins of the world. And this has been known for a long time. And there's parts of the world where uh, people know they can't use the accelerated mortar bar test at all because the results uh, will, will give you false uh, results, uh, such as these bad actors. However, what hasn't been known for as, uh, as long, and it's, it's really come to light in recent years, are what we're labeling here in the upper left-hand quadrant as really bad actors. And these are aggregates that actually pass the accelerated mortar bar test, but they fail the concrete prism test. Very counterintuitive that you would get this inverse relationship. Uh, these are what we call the really bad actors, or the Billy Baldwins of the world. And uh, these are the most concerning, because any aggregate that falls in this category, uh, many specifiers and, and highway departments will um, consider these aggregates to be non-reactive, and they will not require any preventive measures at all for the situation. Uh, given the time constraints, I won't go into the details much on what's causing uh, this behavior, but what I can say is it almost always occurs with coarse aggregates, and our experience is, is it tends to be the coarse aggregates that contain chert, um, and uh, it, it has to do with something known as the pessimum effect, uh, where um, the, the relative amount of chert in the aggregate uh, will determine whether or not you, you pick up expansion in the mortar bar test. Uh, we do have a published uh, document that explains this and gives alternative guidance for aggregates that fall in this category. So I just wanted to, to, to draw some attention to these uh, aggregates that behave in ways that we, that we, uh, that, that we would prefer that they didn't. Um, I'm just going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about the, um, the accelerated mortar bar test and its use in uh, evaluating SCMs. Again, this is ASTM C1567, the same test procedures as the accelerated mortar bar test, but again, what we're going to do now is evaluate the use of SCMs to see uh, how much is needed to control expansion. Um, it, this test has the same limitations as the, as, uh, the accelerated mortar bar test, and which means that you, know, you, you need to make sure that your aggregate itself is giving you the right results first before you start evaluating preventive measures, and I'll get to that in just a minute here. Um, generally speaking, uh, there is a reasonable correlation between the results of this test uh, at 14 days and the results of the concrete prism test after two years of testing. And I'll show you here, this is kind of a data dump of a bunch of different results from uh, our various labs. And what you'll see here is that uh, there are quite a few aggregates that, uh, that are the good actors. They're giving us um, you know, reasonable correlation here where we're getting pass. Uh, both test methods are, are resulting in passing results in the lower left and in the upper right quadrant. And, um, but again, we will see cases where we have the bad actors and even the really bad actors uh, that come into play um, because you're, you're still dealing with the inherent uh, uh, nature of the aggressive nature of this test itself. But the good news is, 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 is if you do have a good aggregate that can be used in the accelerated mortar bar test, um, you can get reasonable correlation in two weeks instead of waiting two years. 
So this is just showing you the, the relative amount of data that falls in the different quadrants. Here's some additional data just kind of showing a, a, some, some uh, similar results. Again, I'm showing the mortar bar versus the two-year concrete prism test. This black line here is a, a, a line of equity in terms of uh, expansion. And what you're seeing here is that there's a reasonable correlation between this, the two tests, albeit there will be cases where we will uh, pick up some of these bad actors uh, in both the bottom right and the upper left uh, quadrant. Now, one question becomes, uh, what kind of dosages of SCMs uh, would you find that you needed if you ran the, the accelerated mortar bar test, and how does that compare to the concrete prism test? And that's shown here on this graph. This is showing the relative amount of, flat, of um, SCMs that were needed in the mortar bar test on the x-axis versus the safe level that was needed in the concrete prism test. The black line here shows uh, the, a line of equity. And what you see with this data set is there's a reasonable correlation in terms of the amount of fly ash, slag, or natural pozzolan that's needed to control the reaction um, between the two different test methods. Um, just going to spend a few minutes just highlighting uh, how we handle test methods in our AASHTO recommended practice, which is PP65-11. Um, we, this, te this uh, AASHTO recommended practice has both the prescriptive approach, which uh, Mike Thomas will discuss in a later session, and it also has, has a performance approach, which allows for the use of the concrete prism test, as well as the accelerated mortar bar test with, with some caveats. So this is just showing some of the details here, but this is uh, essentially identical to ASTM C1293. Um, and we also uh, allow for the use uh, of, of testing lithium admixtures um, in this procedure. So lithium-based admixtures can be used directly in the concrete prism test. Uh, you do have to wait two years for that, uh, that, those results, um, uh, like you would with testing SCMs. So I did want to at least hit, make the point that uh, the concrete prism test is suitable for evaluating lithium admixtures. Um, in terms of using it as a performance test, it has, uh, I'm just highlighting some of the same issues I already discussed. Um, it can't be used to evaluate alkali thresholds for, because of leaching. Um, and it can't be used to look at low alkali cement in combination with SCMs uh, for, for the same reason. Um, we do boost the alkalis to one and a quarter percent alkalis, uh, as is done in, in the concrete prism test. And this is intended to, to provide a high enough alkali content to begin with that there will be sufficient alkalis in the prism during the course of the test to trigger expansion. Um, as was stated earlier, um, we strongly recommend that prior to using the accelerated mortar bar test uh, in your local area, that one first establishes a reasonable correlation with the concrete prism test. Uh, this comes out of the AASHTO PP65-11. And what this is showing here is the one-year concrete prism data on the x-axis versus the 14-day mortar bar expansion on the y-axis. And uh, what our recommendation uh, here is that provided that your data falls somewhere in this pink band, uh, you're, you're then allowed and uh, able to use this test to evaluate SCMs. Uh, and uh, I would urge uh, uh, folks that are more interested in this to, to look for the specific details in the AASHTO uh, recommended practice. Um, with regard to the accelerated mortar bar test, uh, the test method is, um, as I said, provided that you can establish a correlation between AASHTO T303 and the concrete prism test, one can then go forward and use the accelerated mortar bar test uh, for evaluating SCMs. Um, what you'll see here is that we don't allow for uh, the use of high alkali SCMs because it's not, um, uh, it, we're not able to really evaluate the contribution of the alkalis coming from the fly ash because we're essentially putting these mortar bars in an infinite uh, supply of alkalis in terms of the host solution. Uh, we recommend a 0.1% expansion limit at 14 days. Um, and just a couple other, other points here. You cannot use the mortar bar test to, uh, to determine an alkali threshold, uh, nor can you look at the effects of uh, low alkali cement, or uh, again, because the host solution is providing an infinite amount of alkalis, and it would dwarf any effect 
of the contribution of, of alkalis coming from the uh, individual materials. Now, uh, lithium nitrate is, is a viable material that, uh, when used in sufficient dosage, uh, can, can suppress alkali silica reaction. Uh, our recommendations with our ASHTO recommended practice, uh, we prefer and recommend the concrete prism test, uh, but again, you, you would have to run that test for two years. Um, uh, you cannot use the standard ASTM C1260 as it exists to evaluate lithium. And it, again, it has to do with the fact that you have an infinite amount of alkalis outside of the, of the, of the prisms or the, the mortar bars. And in the inside, you would have a finite amount of lithium that was put in the bar initially, but that amount of lithium will be completely overwhelmed by the external uh, alkalis. So um, you, we do have a modification that we have recommended where one can modify the ASTM C1260 test, and then you could um, potentially use that to evaluate lithium admixtures and get results in, in, in two weeks. Um, one point should be made here is that we do not have the ability to prescribe the amount of, uh, of lithium needed to control a given aggregate because there's not a very clear link between how reactive an aggregate is in terms of its uh, expansion level in the concrete prism test, for instance, and the amount of lithium that's needed. Um, so the only way to determine how much lithium is needed is to do performance testing. I mentioned that the accelerated mortar bar test uh, can be modified uh, for testing lithium. I'm not going to go into it in detail here, and I'm just showing here kind of a snapshot of a flow chart that can be used um, following the ASHTEL protocol. Without going into detail in it, uh, one point uh, is, is certainly worth making. And that is, based on a significant amount of data, there will be certain aggregates that you could not use um, the accelerated mortar bar test to evaluate lithium. And that's one of the first steps of our protocol for testing um, lithium, is, is you run kind of a quick screening test, and the outcome of that um, may, in fact, point you down here to the bottom right-hand corner and telling you that you could not use the results from the mortar bar test, but rather you must use the concrete prism test. Um, most of the aggregates can be tested in this test, and uh, if they are tested, um, the procedure again is given in the ASHTO protocol, and more or less in, a, in about to, by testing two different mixtures of a given aggregate, you can estimate how much lithium you would need to suppress expansion. So just in the last few minutes here, I um, just want to kind of talk about this movement towards the ideal test. Um, and again, as I said in the first slide, we're not anywhere near there yet. Uh, a lot of uh, researchers are working on it. I think we have a reasonable um, suite of tests right now that, uh, when used judiciously, can give the right answer in terms of aggregate reactivity and also can um, estimate the uh, amount of, of SCMs or lithium that's needed. Um, but we don't have a test that can actually test the job mix. Um, or uh, it, it, what we really want is one that we can meet all of, the, of, of these bullets uh, on the slide here. We want to be able to evaluate SCMs and admixtures. We want to measure aggregate reactivity. We want to measure the impact of cement alkalis and potentially determine the alkali threshold for a given mix. Of course, we want the results instantly, if possible, or at least in a couple weeks. But most importantly, we need the results to be reliable and to correlate with field performance. During the course of the presentation today, I went through a variety of different test methods, and now we just have a little box to check off how, how close we're getting to that reliable and, and ideal test. You'll see here that tests like 441 and 227, they're unreliable uh, for the reasons I discussed. Uh, the exposure site is quite reliable, but unfortunately, uh, it's, it's very difficult to establish an exposure site to have the resources and the space and it takes a long time to get uh, uh, expansion of outdoor specimens. Uh, it might take sometimes five years, 10 years, or even 20 years. So it doesn't uh, quite meet the requirement for, for rapid uh, testing. Uh, the concrete prism test has quite a few positive attributes, but we know we can't evaluate cement alkalis due to leaching, and we know that one to two years might be too long for many researchers. The accelerated concrete prism test, this is the test I described where the testing is done at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we know that there are some inherent flaws in that test, and the reliability is the biggest, uh, biggest question mark. So hopefully in a few years we'll have a test uh, where we can put a green check in every box, but uh, we're not there yet. 
Um, kind of to summarize this overall uh, concept here, if we were to plot uh, accuracy, increased accuracy on the y-axis, and speed of the test on the x-axis, things would stack up as you see them here. The field performance and the actual aggregate used in the field is a great indicator of how, how it might perform in future construction. The problem is you might need five years or more um, in order to, uh, to, to use field performance as any index. And I'll come back to field performance in the next slide just to talk about how we could use field performance if we tried. Uh, large outdoor blocks, um, very useful. We've got some great data out of it. But typically, we're talking more than a couple of years of test duration and large resources needed for such an endeavor. Uh, we start going down here to the concrete prism test. The accuracy is getting less because of leaching. And the speed is, uh, is, is uh, getting a little bit more rapid. Uh, but uh, our most rapid test is the, the accelerated mortar bar test here, which is typically done in 14 or maybe 28 days. But again, the accuracy of that test um, with many aggregate types can be called uh, into question. So in summary, what, uh, what I've discussed here today went over a variety of different test methods, but the three that we uh, recommend the most are the use of petrography, the accelerated mortar bar test, and the concrete prism test. Uh, for all of these um, test methods, what I think is most important is we have to underpin the results of accelerated laboratory testing with outdoor um, field sites. This is just showing here a couple of sites on top from Canada with the nice warm weather on the upper right hand corner. And uh, the, the site on the bottom right is the Treat Island site. Um, off the, and on the bottom left is the Austin, Texas site. Um, these sites are really proving to be invaluable in terms of underpinning our test methods. But um, what, one thing we have to, to, to be clear about is that uh, sometimes uh, exposure sites might take 10 or 15 years to bear fruit in terms of expansion results. And it means that with time, we, we will be changing our, our uh, recommendations for lab tests as we learn more about field performance. With regard to field performance, one question that's often asked is, for a given aggregate, can we use past field performance to predict future field performance? And the answer is uh, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, if all of the criteria in this slide can be met, then you'd have a reasonable ability to predict uh, future performance. Um, you would have to make sure that the concrete that you're considering to be uh, cast is essentially identical to concrete that's been out in the field for a long period of time. It has to have the same cement content, the same alkali content. Uh, it has to be at least 10 years old. It has to have um, comparable or at least as severe um, uh, exposure conditions. Uh, petrography has to prove that the aggregate that, that's being considered is the same as the one that, uh, for which field performance is available. Uh, the amount and type of SEMs has to be the same, as does the water to cement ratio. It's extremely rare where we can ever meet all of this criteria. Um, but at least it gives us some guidance in trying to uh, use field performance in a quantitative, uh, predictive fashion. So in summary, uh, I discussed various ASR test methods focused on the, the two or three that we recommend most. Um, generally speaking, the, the tests that are the most reliable tend to take the longest and, and vice versa. And lastly, you know, we are making progress towards this ideal test, but we're a long way to go. And um, I'm quite confident to say that in the next five or 10 years, I'm sure that the guidance that uh, will be generated uh, will, will continue to, uh, to change and, and be modified uh, as we get more data and we learn more from field structures and outdoor exposure blocks. Um, with that, uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions. And I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fulliard. Uh, we do have just a few minutes left, and we'll take a few questions now. Once again, I'll, I'll open it up, uh, the audio, to all of the uh, presenters. And um, the first question we have is, due to the saturation, sorry, due to the saturation of the sodium hydroxide in solution in the C1260 test, does the cement's alkalinity matter? 
Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. Um, generally, the, the alkali content of the cement does not make a big difference in the accelerated mortar bar test because of the infinite supply of alkalis in, in the host solution. Um, it does tend to make more of a difference when you evaluate SEMs because higher alkali content in the cement um, will actually activate the fly ash or slag in the early stages, of, say in the first 24 hours, and that will actually have uh, some effect on the test itself. But. Okay. And the next question, is there a test method appropriate for testing the effectiveness of various cements, particularly qualifying a low alkali cement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, we really don't have a test method for evaluating low alkali cements. Uh, for the reasons I discussed in the presentation, it's primarily the leaching um, that occurs in the concrete prism test. Um, the best way to do it is to cast large outdoor blocks and store them for, um, for, for quite, a, quite a period of time. Um, we've done that as part of this federal highway program. We established a, an outdoor exposure site in Massachusetts uh, with the highway department uh, as well as Hawaii. And uh, unfortunately, that's the best that we can recommend at this point. It's usually not practical, but it is at this point the only way we can get at that answer. Okay. Next question, are you aware of autoclave testing of PRISM with much shorter times than 1293? Um, that's, uh, so autoclaving is a, is a technique where, where bars are tested or PRISMs are tested at high temperature coupled with high pressure. Um, there has been quite a bit of work done on autoclave tests. Most of it has been done with mortar bar testing. Um, there has been some testing with concrete PRISM. Um, and in some cases, you will get a reasonable correlation between the autoclave test and, say, the concrete prism test. Um, but the test itself is, is very, very unrealistic and very, very severe. Um, th that is the autoclave versions of these tests. Uh, temperatures are, are often above 80 Celsius. We're applying an external pressure. And typically, the, the, the specimens we would test would have alkali contents way in excess of those in the concrete prism test. So um, at this point, we don't really have any firm recommendations or, or uh, you know, we, we couldn't recommend the autoclave test as a faster way of getting the concrete prism uh, results, unfortunately. Okay, next question is, if the C1260 was designed around a 14-day soak, does this invalidate the 28-day soak period due to the aggressive nature of the test itself? Why even consider the 28-day soak period? Um, well, the, the, let me first say this, that the 14-day expansion limit in the accelerated mortar bar test was established because of its correlation with the concrete prism test data. So that was the original impetus for the 14-day uh, uh, duration of the test. And our experience is that, is that the correlations tend to be best between 14 days and the concrete prism test data. Um, there have been uh, various agencies and owners and uh, uh, corporations that have uh, recommended the 28-day test, but our concern is, is exactly what was voiced by the question itself. And that is, um, you have a very severe test, and now you're doubling the duration, and it's very difficult to find um, solutions that will actually control expansion when we go to a 28-day test. Um, oftentimes it means that you might need 50% more fly ash um, based on the results of 28 days versus those at 14. And those high levels of SCMs are often not allowed due to uh, constructability issues or even concerns over scaling. Uh, there was a couple of papers that were written uh, by Mike Thomas and, and uh, Alanis also that, that have a good data set. And um, a paper a few years ago that was that was published that that compares 14 versus 28 days, and we'll be happy to um, forward that to the to the to the uh, participants after today's session. Okay. Next question is: Can we say that if the pattern cracks develop later, say after one year, it is ASR, and if it develops quicker after the concrete is set, it's shrinkage cracking? Uh, that's a that's a good good question. Um, it, it, it varies in totally based on the mix design and the exposure conditions. Um, in most parts of, of the country, you know, you, you won't see much ASR at all in the first few months. And one could hypothesize that if cracking occurred in those first few months, it, it may be due to shrinkage or, or other issues. 
Um, but uh, it, it's it, it's very difficult to make a definitive um, recommendation based on the on the, the time that uh, the cracking is observed. Uh, in Texas, for instance, we will see expansion in field structures in in the order of months sometimes, and in that case, it's much more difficult to separate the uh, the cause from the effect. Okay. Uh, the next question, this will probably be our last one, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Um, have any of today's presenters seen an aggregate that tests as non-reactive that will become reactive when used in combination with another aggregate? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, generally speaking, when we, let's talk about the concrete prism test. We generally recommend that for that test, you only test uh, a a reactive material with a non-reactive companion. So you would test the non-reactive coarse with the reactive fine or vice versa. There are cases where if you combine two reactive aggregates together, you actually may see a reduction in expansion um, or sometimes you may even pass the test. So our current recommendation is, is to not combine the various aggregates that are using on, used in a given job mix, but rather to evaluate each of the aggregates separately and the aggregate that expands the most um, then governs in terms of, in terms of its uh, of, of its use in, in its uh, how we would use it in a prescriptive or a performance based uh, approach. Okay, uh, appreciate that, uh, Dr. Foliard. Um, just a reminder to those attendees who submitted questions that did not get answered, uh, we will attempt to uh, follow up via email to to answer those questions if we can. Uh, I want to thank all of the presenters uh, for their uh, presentations today, and thank you to all the attendees as well. Remember that the next session is scheduled for February 13th. That's a week from today at the same time, being 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the final session will be uh, the following Wednesday, February 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, just watch your email box, email, and you should uh, be getting information regarding those upcoming sessions as well. And thanks again to everyone for attending, and have a great day.